minus 30 seconds. T minus 20 seconds. You are now tapped into the coolest reptile podcast in the world. Welcome to Trap Talk's Holy Venomous Session with Patrick Holmes, the great Patrick Holmes. I'm your boy, MJ. What is good, everybody? It's your first time tapping in. Do your boy a favor. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. That way you're on top of every single podcast I drop here on the Trap Talk uh, podcast YouTube channel. I want to say shout out to all my subscribers. Shout out to all my loved ones. Shout out to all my Patreon members. I got to say, man, if you are looking for exclusive content, if you want to get more uh, deep uh, vision of what's going on here with the Trap Talk, man, come join the Trap Talk family. Just had some sick-ass Texans join the Patreon family recently. I got to say, I feel blessed. Shout out to Mark Hager. Uh, but, guys, as soon as you join the Trap Talk Patreon family, you get a link to the Discord, and that's where you get tapped in with over 140 trappers in the building. God, if you want to talk about a way of growing and having fun, this is it. Anyways, I got to say, shout out to my Patreon members. I got some members. Guys, I just got some supporters out there that are just fucking, they remind me that I just, why I need to go as hard as I do in this podcast game. And that's why I ain't going to stop. Shout out to my Patreon members. I love you guys. If you uh, want to see what I have going on other than podcast stuff, um, if you want to see what projects I work with personally, what I have for sale, ball python wise, because that's all I can sell is ball pythons. Um, go over to trapgod619 on Instagram. That is my Instagram page. I'm very active. Um, I put a lot of my good, uh, Put a lot of my, my, my work out there, okay? So go give me a follow, and then uh, go follow the podcast's Instagram page as well, the Trap Talk Podcast. Um, and then I got to say, uh, please, I have a Facebook page now, guys. I'm, I'm, I'm just going the, I'm going the opposite direction as far as what I used to do. I'm not going to be Mr. You know, F Facebook. I'm going to use Facebook as much as I can. Go Facebook. <laughs> just kidding. No, but really, guys, please, go like my new Facebook page, the Trap Talk Podcast. Go get those likes up. Go follow me. I'm going to be putting cool stuff out there as well. And you can also watch lives from that page. Um, and yeah, appreciate you guys so much. Now, also, if you're looking for other content on YouTube that I do, you can go over to the Trap Vlogs. That's where I put out weekly uh, vlogs of what I have going on with my collection and uh, whatnot, my projects. <clears throat> but the cool thing about the vlog, once a month at least, I go to somebody's uh, private collection and I do a private tour and whatnot. It's so awesome. And, and I, I like to bring those kind of vlogs to this channel as well. There's so many amazing keepers out there. And I'm so blessed that I'm able to visit one of these keepers every month and just kind of give them to uh, give them a, a platform to show what they have going on. So either way, I have a lot of amazing stuff to come to that channel. So make sure you head over to that on YouTube, the trap blogs, go, go subscribe. And then if you really want to catch up on past guests that I've had, I've had on this show, if you don't want to get slept on, if you uh, miss certain things, well, guess what? Go subscribe to the trap clips as well. And uh, every Tuesday you see a, a weekly clip of a guest that I had on in the past. Like I said, look at that. Look at that group of Conjo guys right there. That's right. Me, Bill Stiegel, Mark Hager, and Justin Gabelka. But guys, it's not a con. This isn't a, this isn't a Conjo episode, okay? I, I, I don't get it twisted. Patrick Holmes on the thumbnail, shirtless. Relax, he's taken. But this is not a Conjo episode. I probably have a couple Conjo questions. Not gonna lie, but I am so excited for tonight's episode, guys, because it's all about the venomous, right? And if you don't know Patrick, Patrick, like you know, you, maybe you not know that he's he's known personally more than his chondro experience and his knowledge uh this guy's venomous game is top notch i've learned and been shown a lot of amazing stuff that um patrick works with so we're gonna deep into we're gonna dig deep into all of patrick's venomous stuff um i have questions regarding certain venomous keeper uh practices which he's no uh, he's not afraid to talk about obviously we're gonna go we're gonna go ahead in on this shit man so uh, first and foremost, I want to say before we deep in, uh, dig deeper into things here, this episode is brought to you by Sim Container. Shout out to John and Alex over at Sim Container. Please head over to Sim Container and just be ready for that next wa wave of Sim Containers to come out. I talked to John and they are almost done. Man, whenever these come out, guys, they go quick. I think he only orders like a thousand and they go really, really quick. So I will keep you guys updated as soon as I know there's more Sim boxes on the website or Sim Containers that you can get your hands on. Either way, 
another good way to get your hands on some sim, sim containers is by going to reptile shows. You know, wherever sim containers at, you're more likely going to get your hands on a sim container, especially if it's a Friday. But Alex, John, thank you so much for your support. Uh, every clutch I've hatched out this year out of a sim box, that's for damn sure. So if it's a sim, it's a win. That's a fact. Thank you so much. Who's here in the early birds? Who's ready to rock and roll? Who's ready for this all venomous talk? Well, look who it is. Focus Cube Habitats. God damn. Hey, listen. All you guys have to do is comment once, and I have a lot to talk about on why you're here. What is behind me? All Focus Cube Habitats. Shout out to Stephen Ashley, two of the hardest working people in the industry. Love you guys. Thank you for your support. Herbert, HB Reptiles in the building, one of the biggest up-and-coming ball python guys. He's had a great year this uh, so far. So listen, Herbert, thank you so much. Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day. Nasarg in the building. R R damn it. Rob Poot. Rob Poot. Rob Poot. Rob Poot Reptiles. Let me know if I said that right off the off camera, bro. Okay. Anyways, it's my boy Nassar. Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day. Runyon Reptiles, run it up. What is good? JKJ Reptiles, what is up? Sean Perry, Sound Serpent. Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day. Savage ass short tail breeder. Go follow my boy, homie Josh, who's just bred some green tree monitors. Definitely heavy player in my heart. Scale fins and feathers. Go give me a follow. My boy right here, Shane, Ricky Bobby, SRT. Big plans with the homie, big, big Shane. So much support coming from my boy Shane and big things in the work. Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day. Eric's More Factory, what is up? Slithery Serpents, what is up? Heathen Hatchery, my boy Brian. Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day, what is up? Jake Hole, this guy earned a heavy stripe recently. And if we could just bow our heads in silence for his first emerald tree regurgitation. He went through it, so. All right, moving forward. Uh, what a stripe to earn! I just got to say, what a stripe to earn! I have plenty of those stripes. Uh, but God damn it, Jake, welcome to the welcome to the gang. Uh, wise guys, what is up? Forget about it. Chantel Pacific Rim Serpents, my homegirl. Trap Talk Patreon member, Team Zoo Dreams all day, every day. Big support. Slithery Serpents. I said hi to you already. You got you got into there. You're slithery. You're slithery. You got it. You got it. You got a double shout out. Joe De Stefano, my boy right here. Trap Talk Patreon member. Brian Bodie, what is up, Brian Bodie? Trap Talk Patreon member all day. I mean, Nate Dog, Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day. Deviant Glass, Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day. Cohens, Constrictors, what is up, player? Welcome to the Grow Tent, Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day. Bods, Exotic Reptiles, the homie, homie Jeremy in the building, Elite Exotics, Aiden Bradley, this fool's player right here. Aiden, are you young? I, there, I know another Aiden, a part of my Patreon family. He's like 14. So I hear Aiden, I think. Are you are you young? But either way, Aiden, I've been following you on Facebook. You got some heat, my man. We're going to be talking real soon. And you're connected to someone legendary in the Condro game. But this isn't a Condro episode, so I got to keep it moving. Thank you so much, Aiden Bradley, for being here. Leland Riker. What is up, Leland Riker? Guys, go give my boy Leland a follow on Instagram. Instagram deleted his original account, and that shouldn't happen to a guy like Leland. Leland's a good guy. Go give him a follow on Instagram. That's what's up. Joshua Stover. What is up, player? Uh, and we're going to end this with Aurelio circa kusas i hope i said that right holy shit all right guys you know what enough is enough i'm ready to get this shit ready to rock and roll because we have someone tapping in shortly after we get things started with patrick oh we have a secret guest who's the secret guest well it's related to venomous because that's what this episode's all about it's all venomous so guys strap up get you uh get your water get something to stay hydrated get something get your mind right but it's all gonna go down we have patrick holmes for the all holy venomous session talk going down let's roll Good. You ready for do do more in the future? Trap yes. talk podcasts? Yes. Man. Only, only trap talk. Exclusive. Yes. Exclusive. <laughs> oh. So stop calling us. From the spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the crop, God love it, love it or not. I'm hot from the hop to the club the spot. Get the club to pop. When I come up with the club the spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the club the spot, get the club to pop. When I come up Get the club to pop when I come up with it. Everybody, we do it. Everybody, we do it.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's a, it's unfortunate because he's wearing a shirt, but it's fortunate because he's here anyway. Patrick <laughs> Holmes, what is good, my man? Flex oh, man. all day. I got my water. I'm hydrated. Uh, you ready? I, I really like that I'm in that intro talking to Bill. That's pretty fucking dope. Fuck yeah. What a time. That was like, that that was like epic, dude. Yeah, well, I mean, that was, I think, three hours. Those are the kind of episodes that just three hours just goes by so quick. We did three hours in that backyard like it was nothing. It was crazy. Yeah. Hey, listen, how you doing, Patrick? Good to have you here back on Trap Talk, but different, yeah. different, different category. We're talking about some venomous, man. Um, We're not talking about Condros tonight? Shit. No, God damn, we don't, we don't have five hours, unfortunately. Um, but, uh, <laughs> no, but, okay, with all, seriously, people, whenever, especially anyone newer in the game, they think of your name and they automatically relate it to Condros. Like that is what you're known for, uh, respectfully, right? Um, but you don't advertise or you don't really push much uh, content that you work with Venomous. Am I right? I mean, you, you, I mean, I don't know if you're maybe doing it now, but that, that's that was a secret to me when I found out. Yeah, I mean, there's um, I've been posting some stuff on Instagram, kind of here, here and there. The I guess it's not really intentional that I don't post a lot of the venomous. I really don't post uh, like I just don't post en enough. I was about to say I don't post a lot. I, I intend to, and I just don't do it enough. Um, I think I have, what do I have like 99 posts or something on my animal Instagram and I, I have like 250 snakes. So it's, you know, I, I have almost that many vipers I'll, almost. I probably have 90 vipers or something at the house. So I just don't, <laughs> I just don't get around to posting it. I'm a procrastinator. But I mean, but hold on. What what you do post is it's. I mean, do you favor chondros over venomous, or how do you really yeah. feel about? That? Yeah, okay. yeah. Percent. But I, what I what I will say though, um, as far as individual species, green tree pythons are are my favorite snake. But as a group, um, arboreal vipers. Are, are my just if we can make a group of snakes um, like that, our, our boreal vipers are, I mean, there's just infinite variety in our boreal vipers. They're some of my favorite animals, period. Now, I, ha I, I do know from asking you on previous shows, um, you know, you're up, your upbringing with snakes. Um, but, I, you know, obviously the venomous side of things been a part of your life since a kid or what? Like, have you always had a fascination for venomous? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I can give you a quick little background on that. Um, my, as far as snakes in general, I mean, that's been my entire life because my dad got me into it. My dad right. grew up being into snakes. And so um, as soon as I could walk, basically, he used to take me out. You know, we'd go walking around in the creeks and stuff looking for animals. Um, and he had snakes when I was a kid. Um, but as far as venomous goes, I've always been interested in it because I was always – I just – I've always been all animals, period. But I had lots of reptile books um, when I was a kid. And obviously there's, you know, some of the most beautiful animals are venomous. And so that's the stuff that, that kind of sticks out. Um, as I got a little older, I was more intrigued by just the fact that they're venomous, um, not just how beautiful they are. When, when you're a kid, it's just, you know, hey, look at the pretty snake or whatever. But I um, caught my first copperhead when I was 12, um, but I wasn't allowed to keep anything venomous back then. I also caught my first rattlesnake when I was 14, um, which was badass because it was a, a blacktail rattler. It wasn't just a Western diamondback or something. Or, and it was in New Braunfels, which is the right. absolute easternmost edge of their range. So they're, they're not even really supposed to be in the spot where I found them. So it was badass that my first rattler was a top-notch silver ornate blacktail when I was did you, keep, did, you, did you keep it and take it home or did you release it? What did you do? No, I actually, I, I took it to the snake farm, um, which is now called uh, Animal World Zoo and Snake Farm. But before Eric Traeger owned it, um, a guy named John owned it. And I took it there um, and traded it for some other stuff that, that I knew I could keep. And then later on, my dad was like, I would have let you keep that rattlesnake. And I'm like, fuck man. <laughs> but, Damn. So, but I started, I started actually keeping venomous um, a couple of years after that, when I was 16. 
Now, obviously, you've gone, you know, you have quite a story. We don't have to get into it because you've already talked about it on my show before. So, guys, go check out that episode I've had with Patrick Holmes. Really digs deep on, uh, you know, why he's at where he's at with the Condros and, and, and what the Condros always meant to him uh, throughout his life. But I got to ask you, you know, you coming out of prison and, and, and you getting your feet established with snakes, when did Venomous start adding into your collection again? Like, when, when did you able, like, when were you able to start establishing Venomous the way you were establishing Condros? So all, all of that happened immediately. I started when I got out. Um, so, you know, I did almost five years. Right. And then I had to go to the halfway house for six months after that. I started collecting snakes. I mean, I still had snakes, you know, the whole time I was gone. I had people that were taking care of snakes from me. My, my buddy, Josh, um, shout out to Josh. He is a Tejas Taurus underscore Taurus on uh, Instagram. He's listening right now too. That's why I'm shouting him out. He's uh, Josh kept a lot of stuff for me while I was in prison. Um, he's one of my best friends, and we still have joint projects going right now. Um, but when uh, shortly after I got out, and some of my friends saw where I was at with my attitude and just where my head was at um, compared to before, once they realized that I kind of had my head screwed on straight and um, I, people just started giving me stuff, man. My buddy Thomas gave me um, a pair of purple spot vipers, a two male modeled rock rattlesnakes. One of them was the most beautiful one I've ever seen. Uh, a couple of Guyana boas, um, a dismal swamp locality copperhead um, just gave me this stuff just to kind of help me start putting it back together, you know? Dude, Patrick, I mean, dude, one thing I'm so blessed about this fucking hobby, man, and this is what brings back to just being a good person could lead you to so many different things, right? And obviously, the way I've I've been given snakes, and I don't know why, but I've had people give me snakes, and I've never been <clears> given <throat> like that doesn't happen where I'm from. There's there's something behind when you do that. What's behind this? You know what I mean? That's always, but I've never like I literally got hooked the fuck up. Um, yeah. but that's like. Like, for instance, we talked earlier, you know, I know we're I'm a long ways from anything happening with the Miss Willie lines, but you're like, you know, will you let go of anything? And I was pretty strict about, no, I wouldn't fucking let go of any of that. But guess what, Patrick, if I did, if I did, you want to know who I would let one go to? Like, and, and, if, and the thing is, it wouldn't be about the money, because first off, you're going to have something that I want for sure. But yeah. I noticed I noticed that about you. Like, I noticed that you were able to establish animals for so long that whatever it is that you want, it doesn't take money for you to get it. Somebody wants what you want and you could get it's and I, I paid attention to that. That's basically what this room's all about. This room is is my trade room where I, I could get whatever the fuck I want if I could breed this. It's not about the money. Um, but again, Patrick, like you know, I mean, there's a lot of other people I look up to, right? But I feel like for whatever reason, whoever started giving you stuff really saw a passion within you that I think like you show, like it's weird. Like you're not you're not con like you're not cocky or brag, but I think when you drop information the way you talk it kind of speaks about your passion and how you feel about it. And, and, and people could read that, especially people who are paying attention. Yeah. Yeah. My so. friend that gave me those snakes, um, his name's Thomas. I'm Um, he's the one who created the, um, venomous reptile keeper mentorship group on Facebook. And we can talk more about that group later. Um, it's kind of important to what we're going to be talking about, but, um, sure. I've known him since 2009 and I met him because of Condros. Um, I bought, um, couple of Wamena and a couple of Kofi Al from him back in the day and a few other things. And, um, and he is a very, very serious, long time, legit venomous keeper and breeder. Um, but, uh, you know, so he was just, I'm sure the stuff he gave me was just some, you know, some extra stuff that he had laying around, but they were top notch animals. And it was stuff that I was really, really into. And, uh, and I was super appreciative of it. And so I just, back on the question that you asked i started keeping venomous stuff literally right out the gate um as soon, soon you know as soon as i kind of had my feet underneath me and, and was figuring things out um and but it's um taken a different turn over the last couple of years because of an arrangement that i have with another friend of mine i can go into that right now if you if you want a just jump straight to kind of where I'm at. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, what's what's the current situation and what arrangement are we talking about? So I have a friend. Um, most people see me. His name's Nick, um, Nick Method. He's a old school Chondro guy. 
he actually designed the the MVF banner, um, and he's a local friend of mine. Uh, and I don't need to go like in too deep about uh, like our arrangement, but basically what we've been going in on a lot of projects together. So a lot of the stuff that I have right now, I would not be keeping if it were not for him helping me fund this stuff or just flat out funding stuff. And basically the idea is that, well, he, he had to move out of state, but I have the space and the experience, um, and the ability to care for this stuff. And he has the desire to, we have similar goals in mind. And so we've just been working together to put together a ridiculous, ridiculous collection of animals over the last two years or so. And it's really, it's not just about what we want to work with or, or what's cool. So many animals over the last couple of years have become so hard to get. Look at what you and me just paid for Moluccan pythons, right? Um, I've never paid more than $150 for a Moluccan python. I got and raped on mine. I know, I know I know you did not pay what I paid, and I got raped on mine. I I, 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 I paid a lot of money. But the money doesn't matter. It's a whole lot more than 150 bucks. We can put it that way. Um, <laughs> but uh, the my point is that that's a, an excellent example of an animal that the last time I bought one, I paid $150 for, for an import. Um, and they don't come in anymore. I don't remember the last time I saw an imported Moluccan for sale. So um, not that they're not coming in at all. You just don't see them. And so our, our idea with those and with so many of the other things that we have um, is that these animals are amazing and they can, the importation can go away at any time. So we are collecting the things that we absolutely love, but that also we know we would hate to see, like not see around if they stop coming in. Um, Basins are a great example. But the reality is all these species that we're in love with are very highly in that realm of one day not being able to import in anymore. Yeah. Like it's it's yeah. very it's, it's just a matter of time. Yes. And so we have some projects that are things that are more common and easier, like the squams and the eyelash vipers mm -hmm. and stuff. But we have with the common stuff, everything we have is extremely unique or just extremely exceptional specimens and then um then we have some rarer stuff too but before we get into like individual species and all that stuff that's that's where i'm at with it right now is just over the last couple of years nick and i have been putting together all this stuff and we we put together a new facility uh, i'm still in the middle of that it's a shit show over there because i'm kind of chiseling away at it because i work so much too but um you know, slowly I'm piecing these new rooms together and I have a dedicated venomous room and it like, it's just, it's badass. And because of working with him, we've been able to just, we have some amazing shit over there. I think I have 15 species of vipers right now. Now, hold on. Especially before we get into the individual species, mm -hmm. my biggest, my biggest meat and potato topic that I want to get into with you right now. Mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I've had not a lot of venomous keepers or breeders on this show, but the ones I've had on this show, probably some of the high, most highly respected, I feel like, and they're out of Texas. Are the majority of re most respected venomous keepers out of Texas? Current, well, currently, there are a few guys that are very, very legit and very well respected that are in Texas. Um, that being said, it's the reason that is same thing with the chondros, Texas and Florida, Florida has always been the number one reptile state in, in the United States. And Texas has always been number two and California is number three. That's just, that's just what it is. But that's part of that's population. Also it's accessibility for imports. That's Florida um, number one. Florida's number one because of what they get in. Everything goes yeah. to Florida. Yes. And also because of the environment down there, because you can, it, you don't, you have to do a lot less uh, environmental manipulation. There's lots of stuff you can keep outdoors in South Florida. Right. So oh my God, uh, yeah, true. Yeah. Which is why they have so many issues with, you know, uh, invasive and introduced species down there. But uh, 
Um, but yeah, so there's tons of really well-respected guys in, in Texas, in Florida, all over the place, but um, it, it's, Texas is a big venomous state because the laws are relatively, uh, I, I don't want to use the word lax, um, but it's just easier from a legal standpoint to keep stuff here. Um, Texas law tends to be like that though, on a lot of things, it's like, you know, pay for your permits, pay your taxes and do whatever you want type. That's just kind of how commerce in, in Texas works. So, right. um, but the, you know, there are lots, lots of venomous keepers all over the place that are super legit, have insane, huge collections that you have never heard of and probably will never hear of. No, okay, um, I'm glad you brought that up because this is what I'm leading to. A lot of these motherfuckers that I'm meeting are not out on social media like the way a lot of us are, and and there's a reason behind it, you know, because, yeah. you know, for instance, I mean, a lot of people could take what you do, Patrick, as pairing up chondros or feeding chondros, and they can mess it all up, right? Yeah. But you could you'll wake up fine. You'll you'll be okay after a chondro bite. You'll be fine. It's you know it's you know maybe maybe a little traumatizing for you in the beginning, but you'll be fine. But these venomous bites, there's no, there's you know, sometimes no forgiveness, right? Um, and, and that's what I feel like some of these people feel better not showing than showing because how nowadays people are seeing something and think, oh, I could do that. Or, you know, well, why isn't he holding it? Like, I'd rather hold it. You know what I mean? Um, you know, that type of thing I feel like is held. Like, there's, I feel like the, the, the venomous keepers are doing it right are the ones not showing what they're doing. Like, I, and I just feel like that's just how it is. Yeah. So I'm going to make a comment on, on bites really quick because it's, um, there's somebody asking about it in the comments. And since we're kind of on the subject of how dangerous it is, because you're absolutely right. The danger behind it is a huge aspect of why a lot of guys are low key. A lot of guys are also low key because they're keeping, you know, it's not legal in their state or whatever. A lot of them have just like a lot of other old school reptile guys. They just have never been on social media or just don't like what it is for reasons unrelated to reptiles. But somebody asked in the comments, if I have um, anti-venom on hand for the species that I keep and ask about my, the protocol. So um, I do not have anti-venom. It is not practical for me. I should I, yeah, I should, but it's not practical for me. I keep so many different species. I do have bite protocols um, from the Florida Snake Bite Institute. I have their entire book of bite protocol. A bunch of species I don't even keep are in there. But the point of the protocol is that if you get bit, you take that to the hospital with you so that the doctors can know what to do because most of them don't know what to do, which is unfortunate. Um, <laughs> it's and, facts, though. It is. And, um, but it's not a common thing, especially the more exotic species and some of the stuff that I keep like the squams, there is no anti-venom for them. So when I got that huge binder from, from the snake bite Institute, that's my bite protocol. I added a page to it. I made a video about this and posted it on Facebook a while back and it was a joke, but it's also not a joke. I added a page to it. The very first page in there is in my handwriting and it says, don't get bit dumbass." Yeah, man. And, 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 you know, fuck, dude, I, I think I do a good job on just not getting in bit, not getting bit in general. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, here, you are, here's the thing. The reason why I don't have venomous bros, because I just know you it, it's going to happen. Right. Especially if you're not on your P's and Q's. And dude, I had and I don't want to go down this rabbit hole because I've already talked about this a lot, but I couldn't keep my hands off my rattlesnake. I could not. Yeah. You're uh, yeah, my, yeah, she, what a gorgeous snake. Now she's with Miguel. She's doing great, but fuck, like, I could have really enjoyed my snake if I didn't traumatize my wife and kept getting caught holding that snake, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but to be yeah. honest, I like to, I'm a physical, I want to, I'm a hands on person. I have to touch it. I don't give a fuck. So I don't have fish. I can't hold the fish. You know what I mean? Like, I just, I like touching fish, you know? No, I don't like touching fish. I'm just saying I like touching things. But what I'm trying to get at here is um, I knew. I'm not mm -hmm. responsible enough to have a fucking rattlesnake. You know what I mean? And I had to own that, you know, only because if I wanted to keep having snakes and not have my wife bust into the room, pissed off all the time, then you'd you, hello. Like you need to be smart about what you're doing. Um, yeah. But I'm curious with you, Patrick, who are some of the people you were surrounding yourself with that were kind of leading these examples that you, you, you go with today? Like who are, obviously there was some sort of mentorship or somebody you looked up to as you were coming up in this 
And I want I, I know a lot of the Condro side, but I want to know the venomous side, maybe who used to do it, but who's still who's who's maybe even still doing it to this day. Sure. So um as far as mentorship goes, I had almost zero mentorship. By the time I started keeping venomous, though, I'd been at 16 years old, I'd been doing the shit for 16 years. You know what I'm saying? I literally have had snakes my whole life. So, um, and, and I, I kind of crash coursed it, but I was, I already at 16 had a ridiculous amount of snake experience. Um, I, I just, I started working in the pet industry when I was 13. And, um, and so, and I, and I wasn't keeping a lot of stuff back then. Um, I have, far more venomous now than I ever have. I, until the last like five years, I've been, you know, it's just somebody who kept a, just a few things off and on here and there. Um, and I have experience with probably 30 something species of vipers, but I'm, I'm currently keeping about, about 15. But as far as um, people that I looked up to back then, I didn't have a lot locally. Um, I had the Dallas zoo um and i could you know i the first time i got a behind the scenes tour of the dallas zoo was in the summer of 95 i was 14 that was also the same same year that i first year i ever hatched snakes first snake eggs i ever hatched were in 95 um and uh i you know i got to see what those guys did back there and their protocol for how they worked the venomous stuff they had some newborn rhino vipers when i was back there which is the coolest fucking thing um i'd God. never really seen baby rhino vipers before um but okay, yeah i got this i'm sorry i'm sorry the, but those rhino vipers dude like what the fuck like if you want to talk about a, a snake that will make you just like take a couple steps back especially if you're not used to them man who yeah. had okay ari shout out to ari flaggle my boy ari and ryu um I, he had one he had one of those big fucking yeah. one and they're dude they're like blood pythons aren't they you're thinking of gaboon vipers that are that big Okay, maybe Gaboon, oh, oh, okay. Gaboon vipers have horns on their nose and they're related to rhino vipers and the um the western gaboons that have the big horns their actual latin name is is Vitus rhinocer rhinoceros so it's no, I those mean, are the, those are the more colorful ones and smaller ones they're, they they don't get as big but they're the ones that are wrote, yeah. right, crazy colors as babies and whatnot yeah, yeah, the yeah the rhinos have the, have more bigger horns and insane coloration, blue, red, yellow, insane coloration. Um, and I have both of those. I I have a a huge gaboon viper. Uh, um, she's a a Congo gaboon that's oh. just a ridiculously massive, intimidating, badass snake. Oh. Um, God, uh, my Thomas gave her to me also, and and um she is the banner picture in our mentorship group um she's just a, a huge snake um but i have i've got a nice female congo rhino as well um but yeah the um like i say the zoo guys um that trip actually is what made me decide that i didn't want to work with the lapids mambas cobras taipans they were um training a a green mamba to eat out of a box that was built onto the side of the enclosure so they could get it to go in there and eat while they would clean the enclosure. And I realized that all of these dudes that I looked up to that worked the, you know, the reptile guys at the Dallas zoo were all afraid of this mamba and rightfully so they're fucking super dangerous and extremely intelligent and so fast that you can't, I can't explain it to you. You have to see how they move to understand how they move. And, uh, so, and I still, to this day, I've had some Cobras and stuff, but they just, the risk, um, to benefit ratio there is just way off for me. One tiny mistake and you're fucked with, with one of those things. Um, so and there, there's just not easy to keep them on the end of a hook. And I have experience with them. I've, I've worked with, with Mambas and Cobras and stuff to, to a small degree, um, but I just, I do not keep them there to me. They're way too dangerous. The vipers are really easy to work for me. Um, but I also, um, some of the guys that you kind of mentioned earlier, you didn't say any names, but there's guys that are, that are my age or younger right now that I really look up to. Um, and, uh, you know, like, uh, like Alex and Kyle that you had on, 
you know i mean i, I mean those are listen i gotta say those are my favorite right there like i, I mean kyle, i haven't met alex but i heard alex is a g i heard he's awesome i've yes. met kyle i met kyle more than three times i think yeah. last time i, I even I, got to meet his daughter so he's really awesome. i was standing there when you met kyle the first time oh man it was a great time i gotta say and kyle bean is just like you know he's he's chill you know what i mean but he knows so much and he wouldn't when I remember yeah. seeing his, I remember seeing his page in front of him and just being like, "What the fuck is this?" And uh, Clob King, by the way, go go check him out. Clob King on Instagram, I, he's a man. Kyle, Kyle, more so than any person I've ever met outside of Florida, spends more time in the habitat of the animals that he keeps than anybody else. That dude spends a ridiculous amount of time in the mountains observing the animals that he keeps in captivity and, and that, uh like bro that it, you can't flex harder than that i feel like like there's nothing yeah. there's nothing more real deal if you're actually in the field wow i just yeah. rhymed all that i'm just saying you can't and that's my biggest thing it's like dude i give it up to fucking like you know andrew shout out to my boy andrew Acevedo. but andrew is on this tip of wanting just to explore like he's tired yeah. of just keeping he does like he wants to do less keeping and do more finding and like Wow, that's a whole other level, you know, but I respect people like that. I love keeping my snakes, and I've said this before, but if I had the resources to just travel all the time and see snakes in the wild, I would, without question, let go of every captive animal that I have. No question. See, I would much like rather go ahead. just be in the jungle looking at chondros than be in my room looking at them. And that just reminds me of how noob I am into this because I'm so content and happy with what I have right here. But at the end yeah. of the day, hearing friends doing what they're doing and meeting Kyle, it makes me think like, hold on. So once once you're doing this for so long, which all them been doing this for a minute, like, come on, like, Dave, I've been doing this for fucking I'm on my what my fifth year, my third year breeding. Like, I'm very new to this compared to all you guys, Patrick, like, especially you, like, like you guys been doing this. So. You know, the fact that you guys have a mentorship group and stuff like that, like this is what I got into this solely for breeding, you know, and, 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 and breeding is what got me what I have behind me. Right. But for me, I do want more than just breeding. I do want, I want to get something more out of this than just, I mean, especially just breeding ball pythons. God damn. I do not want to die going out of just a ball python breeder. No disrespect to anyone out there. I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> I can't, Patrick. I, I can't, like, there's no way, like no fucking well, way. I had, look, man. I tell you what, with that wall you got going behind you right now, something's going to come out of that before long. There's no doubt about that shit. Oh, man. Day by day, bro. Day by day. But, okay, let's get back to you here, man. I mean, I'm curious with, uh, you know, I have uh, people I brought on that caused stirrups in people who were, fuck it, I'm not going to even, why am I even going to try to beat her on the bush? Shout out to Cody and Pito. Cody Bartolini. Uh, you know, somebody I met through Forrest who, I mean, dude, I, I've never been to Cody's facility or I've never seen his shit in person, but what I've seen in videos or part of their Patreon page, it's not like his, his, his shit is nuts. Like it's fucking, have you, you know, have you seen what, have you seen his, uh, his oh, yeah. Yes. oh my God. Right. But, but guess what? You know, I, I mean, I've brought people on that weren't the best venomous handler examplers out there. <laughs> And, and 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 Cody, the only time Cody ever calls me is when something like that would happen. And I obviously I'm a lot cautious of that now because I don't want to be that person. Um, but 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 it's for a reason. Like I mean, because a lot of shit that is said out here, people take to heart and they and, and they try to reprimand it most and foremost, right? But for you, yeah. Patrick, like, where do you draw the line with certain things? Like, I mean, people could do what they want with their animals, and let's just keep, obviously keep about the venomous right but at what point in your eyes patrick is somebody really making it more about themselves versus the animals and, and maybe they don't even see it so let's there's a lot that i can say about that um give it the to first me. thing oh, the first thing that we have to get out of the way before i talk about any of that and this is something that everybody who keeps animals of any type maybe not any type Everybody who keeps reptiles needs to understand that this is a selfish thing that we're doing, okay? 
ever people want to on online it's not just about reptiles it's all over the world and every subject but people love to get on and just trash other people for how they do whatever they do and get all fucking high horsey about shit and say oh you should be keeping them this way or you shouldn't be doing that or that's cruel or it's not best for the animals if you keep reptiles you may care about the animals but it is a selfish thing you're keeping a fucking jungle dragon in a box some people's boxes are bigger. Some people's boxes are prettier. Some people's boxes have a bunch of automated technology on them. Some of them are boxes with newspaper. I have all of that shit, the whole range at my house. I have badass planted enclosures, and I'm a tub warrior, too. I have all of it. I do what I <laughs> for me. A tub so, warrior? I've never heard yeah. that before. No, yeah. That was hard. That was so Patrick, I was so sick. My baby room right now has about 140 snakes in it. And while there are actually two corn snakes in there, the rest is chondros and, and arboreal vipers and, and scrubs and Amazons and shit. And they're all on paper. But that starts to change as animals start getting older. And I've been setting up naturalistic enclosures. But anyways, that's off subject. The, that's only a little off subject. The point is that this is a selfish thing. And so it's never all about the animals if you think that you're deluded it's if they it's if you were all about the animals you would not keep them in captivity so just get get that out of the way and admit to yourself that it's a selfish thing that we're doing and then you can on top of that be about the animals so when it comes to handling venomous reptiles um i have to say i was disappointed with tyler's episode um for well i didn't even i couldn't even listen to the whole thing i uh, the i i tuned in on that one because i wanted to hear i disagree with the way he with public free handling i don't think people should be posting free handling cobra pictures on fucking instagram or whatever but that I don't sit out there and preach about that shit or tell people hey stop doing that or trash people on the internet because you know, do you, whatever. I, like, I don't have time to spend time talking about or worrying about what other motherfuckers are doing. I got my own shit to worry about. Um, I got, I, have, I spend a great deal of time trying not to get bit by venomous snakes. Uh, definitely don't have time to be playing with them on fucking Instagram. Um, so that's how I spend my mornings three or four days out of the week is you know, coffee hasn't even kicked in yet. And I'm in there dodging viper strikes, cleaning cages. Right. So, uh, <laughs> but I thought that Tyler uh, would have better answers about the free handling thing, because it's something that he's so well known for, but he got kind of flustered and defensive. And he said, bro, like 6,000 times in five minutes. And was calling it freehanding. He wasn't even pronouncing it properly. Like, I don't even know how you can be a, like an internet famous free handler and not pronounce that properly. But anyways, he I seems think, like he's, he's, he, he said that it's free handling is not even a, it's not a real thing. It's not, a, it's like, it's there's, it, that, that's what he, he said. It's, he said it's new. He said that's a new term and that is absolute utter bullshit. That is utter bullshit. That's, all, like say that whole spiel right there was what turned me off and I just stopped listening because I was really disappointed that he didn't have better, more thought out answers for such a serious subject that he's such a huge part of. Can I, um, can I, say, can I say something though, Patrick, before we continue yeah. on this? I, I've actually yeah. seen, I've, I've met Tyler before. I, yeah. I know, I noticed there's no, um, per, like, there's no agenda behind what he does. He is who he is. He just, he don't give a fuck. Yeah. Like, he, he is yeah. who he is. He has a lot of things that he's good at and that what he does. One thing that I know that he knows is his animals. I'm not giving him any excuse, but I, I seen, I've been in his collection and yeah, it's a scary yeah. room. Don't get me wrong. It's a scary ass fucking room, but those fucking Florida guys are nuts. Like they're just nuts. And, yeah. and, 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 but just because somebody's that lax with somebody, I don't think that's a good thing to be. And, but I can just tell you, there's no changing Tyler. Tyler's Tyler. And I respect that about Tyler. Um, yeah. But at the end of the day, like I, it's unfortunate that Tyler just can't be Tyler without creating mini Tyler's. And that's what's happening is there's these mini yeah. Tyler's coming along and they're trying to be him. They want to be him. They want, and, and then, you know, God, 
I mean, how you feel about Tyler? I feel about that Chandler guy. I can't stand that fucking Chandler guy. Like, I, with all due respect, I've I've had interactions and seen how cocky this guy is, and I'm like, all right, I, that's one thing I, I I understand to where like, you know, you shouldn't be on a fucking pedestal when it's the animals is what well, you feel like just because the animals you work with, right? Well, that's not a reason to be cocky. I don't think you know. I literally can't like I don't ever even watch any of that stuff. Like I know who that is, but I don't watch any of those channels. Um, I I can't get into the like it's like, it's like watching the Kardashians for reptile people. <laughs> yeah, it, I just I can't get into the over like the sensationalized and over dramatized. That's why I stopped watching Animal Planet. It's it's why I um well it's why I don't watch. I won't. I don't even need to say any names. There's several YouTubers that I have met in person and I really like them as people, but I don't watch their channel because it's, they, they make videos in a manner that gets it's them. Cringe. Lots of, it's yeah. cringe. Yeah. And it's, so it's just not, not my thing. And again, more power to a man that that's great, but it's just not my thing when it, with free handling venomous though, I would say I don't care what you do with your animals or in your own home or whatever, but even if you don't post it on the internet, if you get bit and it becomes public knowledge, it it's just bad press, man. It's it's not good. This is how laws that restrict our ability to keep these things get created because people make mistakes. So then when you're doing it on the internet, it really doesn't look good, especially when it's super popular. And, uh, and then lots of other people want to do it as well, which of all the reasons I could bitch about it, that's the worst one. Like you just said, creating many Tylers, but I don't, um, you know, I don't spend a lot of time talking about that. I don't get on and, and like trash these dudes publicly. I don't care to, you know, I just, I don't have time. I don't have time for that or to be concerned with it, but I don't agree with it. And I do not handle any of my venomous snakes i've done that exactly one time in my entire life and by free handling i'll define that no equipment and no restraint okay free free <laughs> I, just free handling i ha i handle stuff without equipment every once in a while for a medical intervention or something i mostly use tubes um, but every once in a while you got to get in a snake's mouth and if their head's in the tube, that doesn't do you any good. Um, so, you know, that, yes, sometimes I'm handling stuff without equipment, but it is fully restrained. Um, sometimes I do hook in hand, right? So I'm have the upper body hooked in the, and the tail in my hand. And I love it when I get to do that because I get to put my hand on that snake. I get a kick out of it. It's great. I get it, but it's not worth the risk to just freely handle that snake. I'll tell you a little story about an interaction with a copperhead I had one time. That it's one of my favorite examples. These guys that free handle, they all say the same stupid shit. I know my animals. I, know, I If you know their behavior, you can get away with it. First of all, almost all of the guys that you know that are popular for this have been bitten. Tyler almost got X'd out by a fucking king cobra. Right. Oh, and you, so, know, you, know, you know, what's crazy is like, man, that could have been because um, if you if you think about the situation, you ask like, well, what was up with the snake? The snake was in deep shed. Like, and, and I, I don't I mean, any snake, no, regardless, you don't fuck with in shed. That's, a, that's like a rule of thumb. Like if a snake's in shed, leave it alone. Like no matter what it is, it's in shed. Even if it comes down to breeding, the males in shed, let the male shed first and we'll put them back. You don't fuck yeah. with snake when it's in shed. Like and and I'm like what like what I, I don't know it, it, what, but the crazy thing is like I said this is what makes Tyler who the fuck he wants to be like that him almost seeing the light and seeing fucking you know and that coming with a one less finger still does what he yeah. does and it, it didn't so, change anything it didn't change anything I mean that, and and that's cool that it didn't change anything and he seems like he's a cool dude and he has a and he, he looks like he's a legit keeper too there's some some of the other guys um, that are. There's two particular Instagram accounts besides his that are really popular for the free handling. And both of those dudes are legit field herpers. They are legit keepers, but they are internet famous for free handling venomous snakes. And both of them have been bitten multiple times. Um, I've 
handling venomous snakes for almost 30 fucking years. Next summer it'll be 30 years. And I have never had a bad envenomation ever. Knock on wood. And um, the worst envenomation, well, from a snake, I've told you the Gila monster story before. That oh, was pretty nasty. God. Let's hey, let's save that story for the end, if you don't mind. I, I want that's a that's a juicy yeah. awesome story, and I, I would like to share that. And you could go and show it off. And then uh, the hot seat questions, I want your shirt off, okay? Just for certain <laughs> for Calvin for <laughs> Calvin Garcia for Calvin Garcia. I already had my shirt off for you once today, so I think we're uh, that's the quota. I, I um, mean, here's the thing: I'm not thirsty. Calvin's thirsty. He needs some of that juice. <laughs> <He's so good. laughs> Um, I, love you, Calvin. I don't know if, if my scar will show up well on the camera, but we can try. So I'm going to tell you, tell you a different story though. I was doing a shoot with Don Champlin. Shout out to Don Champlin. He's the dude that if you guys follow me at all, you see his stuff. Um, he's a local friend of mine. That's a badass pro photographer. It's Don's reptiles on Instagram. Um, and you see, I post his stuff on Facebook. He does a lot of photography with my animals and it's, we have a blast every fucking time. Don is a badass dude and he is a super talented photographer, but we were doing a shoot one day with a copperhead and this copperhead was super calm. It never musked. It never rattled its tail. It never got, you know, jerked back in an S curve and defensive posture. This thing was like butter dude it was acting like a corn snake he was doing great we got some awesome shots of him um he was an animal that i picked up doing a removal um for a friend of mine and uh getting some some we, we moved four four copperheads off of that property and this one was exceptionally pretty and i kept him so don could photograph him and uh while we were doing the shoot he was crawling up the snake hook and the snake hook is metal it's not, doesn't have a heat signature. Copperheads are pit vipers. Doesn't smell like anything. I disinfect my equipment with rubbing alcohol when we're doing the shoots. I do it. I disinfect all my stuff with rubbing alcohol basically every day anyways. But um, the, you know, this, this hook had nothing, no smell, no heat signature. This snake is calmly crawling along the snake hook, turns his nose down and bites the hook. Zero warning. He did it quickly. He was not upset. He was not defensive. It was not a, didn't look like a feeding response. I have no clue why that snake bit that metal um, hook. A few minutes later, he did the exact same thing, man. Shit was not just a fluke. So I've been keeping snakes my whole life. I can tell when they're calm, when they're defensive. I get bit on a regular basis because I'm flying through the, the stuff just doing my maintenance, but I don't get bit by the venomous stuff, except the mangrove snakes, because I don't treat the mangrove snakes. And we can talk about rear, rear fangs. Right. But listen, I, was, I, I want to also say to Patrick, um, and we're going we're gonna to do a little intermission right now, but hold on. I, I want to say right now that a species that I work with, and this is when I know, like, there are certain things that are unpredictable out there. The fucking white yeah. lip python, the white lip. Okay, let's talk about the white lip. And and I I feel like I have the chillest white lips, but they will still, for no reason at all, could just be being on my arm and just, and I'm like, what the fuck? I didn't do, I did nothing to you. You know what I mean? Um, and listen, I want to say right now, we have someone that's about to tap in, but I also want to say, again, this episode is brought to you by. Sim container. If you got eggs, put them inside of a sim box. Do you put your venomous? Uh, do you have any venomous eggs that you put inside of a sim container yet, here, Patrick? Yes. So, and we we said we we're going to talk about that, so we may as well throw it out there because we just brought up the mangroves and the rear fangs. But, right but, but, now, but, but, but before we do, I want to say, tuning in right now, we have okay. the damn man himself, the one, <laughs> the only. Scrub King Stephen Kush. How you doing, Stephen? <laughs> Good evening, gentlemen. Yeah. Dude, are you in the scrub house right now? Oh, hell yeah. This is the, the scrub house slash podcast studio. That's what the fuck I'm talking about. Yep. All right. Patrick. I, I like scrub pythons. Yeah, so do I. It's crazy. Yeah. It's yeah, I'm getting ready to have a whole my, that whole PVC wall that was in my living room. Remember that thing? That whole wall of PVC cages? I'm filling it up with scrub pythons. Hell yeah. All right. Again, yeah. Hey, but guess, uh, guess what? 
Stephen, just as much as we would like to talk about Condros with Patrick, it's not a Scrub Python episode. This is all about the venomous. Because <laughs> you know, because people are going to find out, you know, Steven's a little venomous freak, you know, like freak elite. You know what I'm saying? Like it's going on with him with venomous as well. But Patrick, like we were just talking about right now, um, you know, we just had a crazy conversation about free handling and whatnot, Steven, which you and I've had plenty of times. So we don't need to get sure. back on that fucking realm again. I want to know exactly what is happening with production side of things with you. If there even is any production side of things with your venomous stuff right now, Patrick. So right now at this moment at my house in a SIM container, shout out to John with SIM. I, I was the first person in the United States to hatch chondros in a SIM container in 2012 or something like that. Damn. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, and John makes sure that I have SIM containers when I need new ones. So shout out to John. Um, but I have divergence mangrove snakes hatching right at this moment at my house. And I am fucking freaking the fuck out about it. Um, Congrats. I, I think I'm the second person in the United States to hatch out divergence successfully. Kevin McCurley did it in 2019. Kevin at nerd. Um, are you saying, are you but, saying on, the pri- on the private sector side of things or just all around? All I, I'm unaware. Please, and somebody please correct me on this in the comments or message me or whatever. But if anybody, I would love to know if anybody else has um, in anywhere in the United States has successfully hatched divergence mangroves, lose on mangrove snakes other than myself and Kevin McCurley. Um, Kevin right. did it in 2019, but then he kept feeding males to his big ass female. I don't even know that he has any males left because I think he fed them all to his giant female. Um, When I say that, I don't mean intentionally. I mean, they fucking cannibalize and you have to watch them really closely. And if you're not pairing them up at the right time or there's a huge size discrepancy, the females will eat the males. Right. Um, But yeah, I, I have, um, I got five eggs. I fucked them up the first time. Mangrove snakes are not super hard to breed, but the eggs are tricky as fuck. I got two eggs, two fertile eggs the first time. And I, well, one was deformed, like badly deformed. So me getting them too wet didn't have any effect on that. That was just what it was. But I did get them too wet. One of them went all the way to term and died before absorbing the yolk. But the this time around they will lay multiple clutches from one breeding up to four in a year. Actually. Um, my girl laid two from the one pairing and the second clutch was five eggs. Um, one of them was dead in the egg and had a kinked up neck. I pulled it out today, but there are two out one and one hatching and one that I pipped, um, when I left earlier today. So hopefully those other two that are still in the egg will, will be all right. But, um, dude, when I went over there this morning and I, and I opened up that sim box and those little fuckers stood up like they do, did their defensive thing. And they started striking at me and rattling their tails. I thought, I thought my fucking heart was going to explode. It was the cutest fucking thing I've ever seen in my entire life, dude. It's fucking amazing. Dude, and listen, an important part of why I want Steven here, and thanks, Steven. Thanks for being here. I appreciate you so much. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, Steven, we don't have to get into detail unless you'd like to, but Steven throughout the last year for sure has collected quite a bit of uh, Venomous collection, uh, Montaigne and whatnot. And uh, yeah. true or false, Steven, at one point when things are right or whenever it's right, you're looking to breed, correct? Oh, I mean, we already are. <clears throat> okay. Um we have a handful of uh, rattlesnakes that are gravid that'll be due to ha- uh, to give birth come like late summer into fall of next year, and potentially a uh, March eye hunter and palm viper. Oh, badass! Jesus Christ! And and, and, and my my thing, Stephen, is like obviously you guys are kind of like what, what cold blooded, aka Reptech, is known for is being more of a collector versus people who sell, even though you're like more like selling now um, with this stuff that you guys are producing, how are you going to delegate where this stuff goes? If you can't hold it all back, obviously, I mean, I mean, you're not going to sell to any of the public at all or what's going on with that. And I also well, same question with you, Patrick too. So that's, you know, something that I thought a lot about. Um, and 
I guess part of the way that the collections come about is, uh, well, a, a few different ways, but the, a couple of ways I look at it are, you know, obviously one, what do I want to keep? And then also what would I feel comfortable selling to somebody? Um, and then there's kind of two metrics you can look at when you're looking at, will I feel okay selling this? One being, well, is the market there? Are there enough competent keepers that want these animals? And two, how easy is this animal to take care of? Like Patrick was talking about earlier with the elapids, you know, you have a clutch of monocle cobras. Might people buy them? Sure. How many people can really safely take care of that animal? Nonetheless, king cobras, forest cobras, mambas, um, stuff like that. Yeah. But a little clobber eye that gets that big as an adult, have a 24-inch hook and go, that's pretty it's, damn easy to take care of. You know, not minimizing the the danger potential with that animal. Um, you know, there's the, the whole thing of like, there's no such thing as a beginner venomous snake that everyone always says, which, you know, th there's a there's a conversation we have there because I feel like no venomous should be a starter snake. But to think, to, to make a blanket statement like that is kind of irresponsible, honestly, because that somewhat insinuates that a black mamba and a copperhead are somewhat along the same level of difficulty and danger, which it's, it's not even close to true. So with the stuff that we're breeding, I kind of put in the two different categories, one of small, easy to take care of for a, a, you know, somebody who's potentially relatively newer into venomous and then rare, high demand. I won't be able to produce enough to sell them to the to people who know what they're doing because so many people want these animals like Mangshans or Parviocula um, or, you know, Crotalus polystictus, stuff like that. We are in the exact same place with that. Our the things that we're choosing to keep. Our criteria, the first criteria is, do we fucking love it? Is it badass? Like, if we don't love it, it's got to go. And we've, had, we've like, bought some stuff and kind of played with it a little bit and then been like, nah, I don't really love these, and, and they got to go. That at, at one point, uh, not too long ago, I had over 20, spe I think 22 species of vipers, and now I think we have 14 or 15. Um, it's crazy. But we're, we're then the, second, the second thing um, is, you know, we're looking at, like, will they actually sell? Like you said, is there a market for it? And this is specifically on not just keeping, but on, on breeding stuff. Um, and then, um, you know, well, there, there's other factors as far as the individual species um, as well. But we, what we, you know, as far as how hard they are to actually breed or, or to raise the offspring or whatever, all those things are factors in what we're choosing. But as far as moving the animals out, it has to be something that's so badass or niche or both that we'll never have to post them. They're going to go to our friends. We're going to be swapping stuff. MJ, just like you were talking about with your the emeralds and stuff like that, lots of stuff that I produce is stuff that I only ever plan on trading off or selling to close friends, and it, it'll never get posted. It'll never hit a fucking table at the show. So crazy example is this. I mean, these Miss Willie lines that I was able to, to get from Stephen and Desiree, yeah. Eighty percent of this was scrub trade. I had to give a lot of fucking scrub heat to Steven to be able to even <laughs> afford these fucking snakes. Look at this sick bastard. Look at him. But I'm just saying, <laughs> like, they, but thank God, like, thank God, I, I, you know, Steven isn't taking trash. Like, Steven knows what he wants, and Steven knew that I had heat, and and thank God I had the heat to get the heat that he had that I needed. You know what I'm saying? But that's how that's how I want it to be, bro. Like, God, it'd be easier that way. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there are other things that, um, especially with some of the, we do have some, some like morph projects and stuff with some of the venomous. And so there's just, there's other stuff that if it's not things that we can, um, you know, easily sell to friends or trade to friends, it has to be stuff that we can just, we'll just dump off to one of our buddies that actually sells venomous snakes at, at low wholesale prices and let somebody else move them and make money on them because i do not like selling venomous snakes i don't <laughs> like dude um, that's, that's why i'm asking this question especially you patrick like shit patrick you don't like selling chondros 
You don't. Uh, well, I don't like selling condos because I'm a fucking hoarder and I want to keep everything. <laughs> but, um, but, uh, yeah, but, but it's like the same sense, but here, you don't want somebody to get bit. Yeah, exactly. And, and shout out to Alex again. He, I actually, I haven't, I have a message pending from him right now because he's trying to get some snakes to me tomorrow. So if he's listening right now, yes, I'm working tomorrow. Um, but Alex and I always say all the time, pair everything, keep everything. And it's kind of an inside joke because we're hoarders, right? We just want to we're we just want to keep everything. But um, I don't. Alex does this full time, and he has the time to vet customers and and to make sure that animals are going to the right places. I fucking work full time, man, and I've got a shitload of animals, um, and and I have a girlfriend. I'm in her office right now. Shout out to Amber for letting me use her yeah. office for this. And. Uh, She's a fucking professional now. I, if y'all weren't aware that she's fully legit licensed marriage and family therapist, and she bills stupid money to sit in this chair uh, and help people with their problems. And I'm call I'm I'm putting her out there right now, but she will legit be in this chair with a blouse on up top, yoga pants, and barefoot down below <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on the Zoom. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. Uh, so Alex. Um, like I say, he vets his customers, but he has more time for it because this is what he does. This is his whole life. I don't like selling venomous snakes because I don't have time to be going back and forth to the airport. I don't have time to do expos and I don't have time to, to vet the customers. And so that's our whole thing with Nick and I is that it has to be stuff we can easily move to our friends or stuff that we can, um, you know, dump off wholesale to one of our friends who actually sells venomous right Okay, Patrick, I feel like you're like the Texas Marshall Mendez right now. Don't you realize that a lot of the energy that not only you put into your own collection, but your own nine to five, you're a fucking passionate nine to fiver, bro. Like you put in your work. Like there's been podcasts that had been done at your work because of your like, like that's what you could do. Like that's passionate. But God damn it, Patrick, like don't you believe at this point that you could just do the snake thing full time and you don't need this job if if you put the fucking same energy that you're doing now into the plant store what if you did this and i'm sorry if it's not a plant store i'm probably wrong I, I, it's high a hydroponic store what is it again it's a uh i work in pest control and i sell i sell pest control and lawn care products lawn care i knew you had something to do with plants i'm sorry um but anyways patrick like god damn like like i came out of fucking nowhere and i made a living out of this i just feel like yeah. Somebody like you, like I God, I wish somebody I had someone like you I could just call every day and I know you're just in your snake room. <laughs> you know what I mean? But you're not. You you work hard, but I'm wondering if that's ever a possibility for you to do the full time snake thing. So here's here's the thing about that. I don't have a desire to do s- snakes full time exclusively because animal production is so up and down and because rather than fall back on volume of, of species that I know will breed. I prefer to work with stuff that's more difficult and more challenging. And, um, and, and those things require more time, but also I'll make some comments on my job and my employer, my employer, he may be listening to this too. Um, Mike Smith is one of my best friends. He's one of the biggest and most important components in my the way my life is right now because he gave me a job fresh out of the joint. Okay. Uh, okay. And, so that's that's deep. But it's it's way deeper than that. Yeah. I grew up working for Mike's parents at their pet stores, and my, so I work. I grew up working with Mike for his parents. So he's been around. Since, you know, I mean, he was really young. He's young. He's three years younger than me. So, you know, we've been around each other um, and he used, he's a reptile guy. He has a few animals now, but he used to keep and breed a lot of snakes. I get to keep animals at my shop. That's where my first level quarantine is, is in the warehouse at my shop. He knows that I do all of this stuff. He, like that he fully supports everything that I do. And for the time being, number one, it's a steady paycheck. And I, I have expensive tastes in snakes. And, uh, um, but I can do reptile, I can, you know, post on, 
post snakes on Instagram or answer questions for people or do whatever, or do the, do your podcast at work afterwards. Or if I get real, real busy with baby chondros, I'll pull a rack up there to the shop and have neonate chondros at the shop so I can just work them as soon as I get off before I go home. And, uh, you know, so, um, it's a, that job is a massive part of the, the reason that I am where I am right now. And, um, just speaking on that specifically, he and I are building a company into something that, I mean, it's so much more than what it was when he hired me fresh out of the, out of prison. You know, we, we've been able to do some awesome stuff and we have similar long-term goals in mind. So, you know, I'm into fitness stuff. I would like to be a, a coach at some point and make money like that. And if I ever got all the way away from this business, um, it would be to do that and snake stuff. So um, I, I would never just full-time do the, do the reptile stuff. Yeah, you know, it's funny, Patrick. I knew there was something deeper than it just being a nine to five. Like I knew it, it had to be because you, you, you kind of treat this like it's your own company. You know, like I like I said, like the way it's a mandatory thing for you to be there for customers, like you, yes. that's the priority for you. And uh, but it's like you said, there's a crazy attachment behind that. And I'm glad I actually got to find out what that was. Um, and that's that's that's, My, awesome. that's good. To hear. Um, I run that shop by myself. So I'm, it's sales, retail, management. I do outside sales. We have wholesale products. We have a service company. I sell service. Um, Mike says his biggest compliment for on me regularly is that people think that I'm the owner of the company. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's super important to me, but it's also all of this goes together, man. It's not a hindrance from my reptile stuff. It, it's the reason I have all of this stuff. Now, the biggest reason, and again, Stephen, thanks for being here, but the re biggest reason why I was so up for Stephen coming on the show is because, unfortunately, like a lot of reason why I'm able to get so excited to have a guest on is because what we're talking about, we keep the same thing. And I'm not at your level with Venomous, bro. And Stephen is somebody who's very inspired and passionate about what he's been building with this Venomous collection. Um, so, Stephen, I want you to kind of maybe – Bring up uh, any topic you'd like right now, Stephen. This is this is your floor. Uh, you got Patrick. Um, anything you want to bring up or talk about, go ahead and take it right now if you like, bro. Yeah, I mean, you know, when when I saw the ad that in, uh, on Facebook that you guys were doing this episode, immediately I was like, man, I I, I need to get on that show. Um, <laughs> one thing that you know you guys were talking about earlier that I, I don't want to talk about again, but as a good preface, is the whole free handling culture, YouTube sensationalism, blah blah blah. Um, you know, there's a group of people that I look up to and, you know, really appreciate of, you know, what I consider the responsible venomous keepers, um, or people that do it in a way that, you know, somebody looking from the outside in, uh, who with curiosity, you know, they see you or anyone, you know, Kyle, Alex, people we're talking about on social media and how they do it. And now they actually are seeing, you know, seeing it from the, from the right side of, of, of the, the argument. Um, so I guess kind of what I kind of want to talk about, you know, was kind of theories and um, I guess what's the right word, just like philosophies of, of responsible venomous keeping, because I, when I first, you know, a couple of years ago was thinking about it and we were thinking about as a, as a whole here, getting into venomous, um, to me, there needed to be a bigger reason other than I like venomous snakes. Um, a, a formative moment for me in reptiles was I was probably 15 or, or 16 um, at my old job with lots of venomous. I never got to work them, but I was around them all the time. We had this little like educational reptile show that we put on and uh, some people from the St. Louis Herb Society were there doing a venomous display. And uh one of the guys, this kind of like stereotypical grizzled veteran guy, um, I, you know, was just showing the snakes and I talked about wanting to work with venomous. And he's like, why? Why do you want to keep venomous snakes? It's a terrible idea. I'm like, and I was like, well, I, I just, I'm fascinated by it. I love him. Like, that's a bad, that's a bad reason. You need a better reason than that. And I couldn't think of a better reason than I, than I love him. And I'm not saying that's a bad reason. 
But this guy has been doing it his whole life, told me it's a bad reason. And it just kind of made me step back and think a little bit, you know, are we just so gung ho as a culture of herpticulturists, nah, so to speak, that um, we don't really ever stop and think about why? And especially when the implications are life or death. Mm-hmm. So for me, one big part of the why was, you know, I, I wanted to use the following that I have. Desiree has just the reach that we have as, as a whole here to show what I feel like responsible venom is keeping looks like. Um, and, you know, not sens- sensationalizing the animals, focusing on, on husbandry and uh, just showing the side of it that I feel like isn't represented enough. So I kind of wanted to talk to you about that too, Patrick, because I feel like you're probably on the same wavelength as me with that. You know, what, what do you think as far as that stuff goes? Yeah, um, I agree completely. And the first thing I have to say is that I it's been badass over the last couple of years to watch you guys build up what you're doing. And um, I love the setups with the Montane stuff. And, you know, seeing little Montane rattlesnakes and stuff, all these um, terrestrial vipers climbing right. is fucking dope because... Yeah, like yeah. you said when I sent you those boa pictures the other day, um, everything at my house is arboreal, right? <laughs> um, but uh, and I can show you pictures of, of rock rattlesnakes, like head down, hunting from uh, from the, the edge of, of an enclosure, which is pretty awesome. But um, anyways, uh, yeah, I. Um, I have to say that I was in the same place that I didn't have any other reason for keeping this stuff other than I thought it was taboo and badass. I thought the animals were amazing and I thought it was creepy and awesome that I had all these dangerous snakes or whatever. I still think all those things. Um, For me lately, while I am, it is important for me to make a good impression um, and to not um spread irresponsible behavior um it's super important to me i also am not public enough with my stuff to be a great example for people in general and i'm only recently starting to lean more towards some of the type of um keeping that you guys have been doing um i'm having Mm -hmm. a blast with my fucking mangshan since i put him in a naturalistic enclosure well he's been a naturalistic ever since uh he passed quarantine he had for reasons that you might remember he had to be in a very long strict quarantine Um, and uh because of other animals he came in with but now that i have him in a bigger naturalistic enclosure it's fucking amazing watching that snake get used to his space and find his little hunting spots and see where he chooses to hide. I thought I was never going to see him again. And now that he's secure with where his hiding places are, he's out more than he was before. You know, we see that. I know you've seen the same thing with tree monitors and stuff plenty of times. Right. And, uh, but, um, it's so I am trying to lean more like semi naturalistic, but back to what I said in the beginning about this being a selfish thing. Yes, the animals get uh, enrichment or whatever you want to call it, but it's also about it's a selfish thing. It's about me being able to observe more natural behaviors because they're in a uh, uh, because they have more options in their enclosure. The snakes don't give a fuck how pretty their cage is. They do not give a fuck how pretty their cage is it's about (laughs) sensory feedback to them it's a the what's the um the term that ari was using when y'all were in his living room um uh contact security that means a lot of different things um but that's what it is for the snakes i use real plants because i hate fake plants The, the snakes don't care whether they're real or fake but there are benefits to real plants that fake plants don't have um, hey, can I say, Patrick, as- Patrick, can I just say though, real quick, like if this, if all the plants were to go away on earth, we would die. We would all right? die. Right. Yeah. So yeah, with that, yeah, for sure. If I, I, I remember like, I remember being told this as a kid and I was like, what? Somebody told me if all the plants is, I learned this in school. If all the plants were just to be sucked out of earth and it was just no plants, no trees, no nothing. 
we would die. The plants do something to keep this air like where we could keep living. So why wouldn't that matter to a snake inside its enclosure? Is what I'm, you know, well, in, I mean? in, in that small space. Huh? What's that? <laughs> I'm just giving you shit. It's like oxygen does still exist inside. Yeah, the yeah so the, <laughs> the plants actually clean the air and improve the air quality and can help maintain humidity as well. But also for me, it just, they look nice. I, I yeah. like life. It looks cool. But it, it offers security and cover for the animals. Um, and yeah, uh, we would all be fucked if there was no plants because then the cows wouldn't be able to eat grass and I would not have steaks to eat and I would die. That would, amen. I, I feel the same way. I without ribeyes. I'm a fucking hardcore carnivore. Um, not in the sense that I only eat meat. I'm not a diet zealot. Um, but anyway, um, I want to, um, I eat a lot of meat. Um, I want to run through really quick since we're on the subject of safekeeping, um, I want to run through some of my protocol really quick because I'm, I'm actually kind of running out of time a little bit. Ms. Amber is waiting on me so we can, well, we've got some, uh, some beef in there that needs to be eaten. <laughs> but uh, um, make, a pot, make it a pot roast all day. Um, so I have a, a, a few things that I do, and some of this stuff, say what you will about Tom Crutchfield. I fucking love Tom Crutchfield. Um, he gets a lot of hate for a bunch of stupid reasons, but that dude has lived a life that, like, we all dream about living for, like, the last, like, 50 years. And I love the way he keeps stuff outdoors. But um, a lot of this handling protocol is stuff that I learned from him a long time ago. Uh, I, I bought snakes from Tom going back to, like, 95 um, but it, and I do not always follow all of this stuff. I'd be lying if I said that I have the safest practices, but every once in a while, something sketchy happens and I clean it up just a little bit more. Right. And I'm, I'm, it's like, I'm better and better every, every day, a little better and a little safer. Um, open all of your enclosures with equipment and not your fucking hands. Oh, I yeah. cannot you the number of times that I slid a tub out with my hands and was like, oh, fuck, that snake is way closer than I thought it was, right? Especially a rack. Yeah. Open your enclosures with your equipment. If you have to do maintenance in the enclosure, remove and secure the snake first with the equipment. Do what you have to do. Replace the snake with the equipment. Period. Don't try to reach in there and fucking snag that water bowl because you think you're faster than that snake is. You're not. You might be, but just pretend like you're not. <laughs> you out a lot of trouble. The thing I get the tagged thing. by those mangrove snakes because I don't work them like they're venomous, and I get bit on a regular basis. I've never had a reaction to a mangrove snake bite. I've been bitten by four different kinds of all different sizes, but I don't ever let them chew on me either, and I, I should treat them they're venomous i got so the the biggest reason what made me just part with my adult mangroves steven was right i, I remember telling steven like Dude, i'm ready i'm gonna let these fuckers go but my eight foot female latched onto my thumb and it's because she got stuck like i i started i i was going to the hydroponic store because that's where i find like my my cocoa substrate like really cheap but i saw i saw these really awesome tall like garden tubs that look great for hides and I'm like, oh, perfect. These would be perfect for hides. They had these tiny holes, like these tiny slots at the top. And I looked at it, and I was like, nah, she can't get – there's no way she can get in that. I was like, I, I think she's good. Sure enough, what happens one morning? Her fucking head got in it and got and her neck stuck, right? Like she got through. And I'm like, oh, my fucking God. So I go, I go get pliers, trying to be as careful as possible. And I remember like the last little – like that I needed, she was able – right when she got loose – she turned around and got my thumb. And I was like, oh, my God. And I just sat there. And she's like chomping forward and chomping forward. And I just went, whip him. I fucking fling the shit out of it. And I had her too stuck in me for like fucking months, bro. Um, but God damn, that was, that was for sure the scariest snake bite I've ever gotten. Just because I like, I, I was thinking, okay, she's going to let go. Like, you know, she'll let go. No, she tried swallowing it. Like, she literally tried swallowing my thumb. And it was the scariest yeah. thing. I, luckily, I didn't have a reaction. I remember I called Cody right away. I was like, I just got chomped on by my eight-foot mangrove snake. Um, 
And first off, first thing he says, you didn't, you didn't use a hook? <laughs> no, I did it. Okay. Uh, but anyways, um, dude, yeah. I mean, like, what if that was a fucking, what if that was my rattlesnake? You know, like, what if that was like, dude, it's so important that you just can't miss steps, bro. And, and even with my own snakes, I move too fast. I, I try to rush, like, you know what I mean? Like, and, and only because like, you know, I'm just moving fast. You just can't do that stuff with the shit you guys work with. Yeah, that's why I'm uh, that's why I'm enjoying setting up this dedicated venomous room because I can just and, and have and I'll probably still have some stuff in one of the other rooms um but it, there will just be a specific protocol in that room and I will be in that groove because a lot of the mistakes that I've made have been having stuff mixed up and trying to just burn through and do maintenance and I get these little close calls and I'm like, oh, fuck, that was sketchy or I could have done that a little bit, a little better or whatever. And uh, and I've gotten uh, to say that when I said earlier, I've never had a bad animation from a snake. That is absolutely not just because I'm such a fucking great handler. I've gotten lucky a bunch of fucking times, a bunch of times. And uh, but, um, you know, there's there's a lot of little tricks that I've picked up. Like I have a lot of venomous stuff in tubs that the racks are built where the tubs can have the lid on them. So I melt two holes in the lid and I run a, a zip tie through the lid and then I can use the hook or even my fingers to lift up the lid of the tub with the zip tie. I've got zip ties run through all kinds of shit so I can move things around with hooks and don't have to get my fingers too close to these animals. I have big, giant tweezers and tongs and stuff that I can use to move around uh, water bowls and things like that for if I don't want to just remove the animal, if I just want to change water or pull a water bowl or whatever. You have to use equipment. You have to know what these animals' strike ranges are and how they move and know very specifically how to stay way the fuck out of the way, like way out of the way. You give them way more room than you think you really need. That's why I don't do a lapids because the lapids move around. Vipers are striking from a stationary position. You stay, you know the strike range, you stay out of it, and you're in good shape. With the lapids, it's not like that. If you've never seen a mamba go shit show, dude, I was working my buddy's mambas some years ago. He was out of out of the country, and I went. To, I had to go steal eggs from a pair of Western Greens. And as a side note. Um, one of those babies that was in one of those eggs that I took from their mom has grown up and reproduced. And those babies just hatched out. It was really fucking cool to wow. see that. Um, yeah. It was in a, in a totally different part of the country. Um, really cool to see that. But uh, I told my buddy's girlfriend and Amber, I said, look, if one of these mambas, they were in the room with me while I was doing what I had to do. But I said, if one of these mambas, gets past me run out of the room and close the door and i'll deal with it that was exactly what i said get the fuck out of here and i'll deal with it you do not want to be around when one of those snakes flips the fuck out it's not you just can't understand how they move and some guys do really well with them and i have i'm capable of it but it's not worth the risk to me it's just it's just not i like my little bitty vipers i have a few big vipers and a whole bunch of little bitty vipers and they stay on the end of that 24 inch hook and you're in good shape, man. That's it's like you said about your rattlesnakes. That's the stuff that you feel more comfortable selling because you know that if people are, are maintaining their protocol, the likelihood of being bitten is so low. It's just so low if you're doing your stuff right. And, uh, you know, almost everything I have over there is really small. We do have some, uh, I don't know if I showed you or not. I probably shouldn't even say this. We'll talk about it tomorrow when they show up. No, 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 no. You, you can't do that on here. I'm sorry, pal. You, it just doesn't I, have, I have a pair of very special neotropical rattlesnakes coming in tomorrow that are almost almost adult size. And um, I don't have any big rattlers right now, and I haven't kept big rattlesnakes in quite some time, and they can be very intimidating animals, and this particular rattlesnake is arguably the most toxic rattlesnake that there is. Um, I'm fucking stoked, but, um, it's, you know, the size changes up the protocol and rattlesnakes don't always rattle before they strike. That is utter bullshit. 
um, especially yeah. males. Know why that is? One thing I want to talk. I want to ask both of you guys this topic because um, I feel like it's important to know where we could compare the venomous to chondros and other species that you guys have been good at keeping. I mean, and that, that comes to like feeding, you know, uh, establishing babies, like where overall, how easy are the venomous to you guys compared to the other species? Well, I mean, guys... that's a very broad question because, uh, you know, it's like saying, so all right, you colubrids, you know, you keep your colubrids, but like, what about pythons? Or what about boids in general? You know, because there, there's a big spectrum. Um, no, oh, hey, hold on. Let, let, let me rephrase that. Okay, so chondros being chondros, right? Chondros, they're they're born with depression. They die. Like it's weird. Don't know what it is, right? Like you know, you we, we, you you guys both work with stuff that are not hots that are really fucking ass kickers. Like really difficult species to work with, right? So what I mean is, when it comes to the difficult side of things of establishing and breeding, where where has that where is that lay at compared to all the difficult stuff that you guys have already worked with? Is what I meant. For me, at least, the the majority of the venomous collection are montane rattlesnakes, and I'll say they're the easiest reptile I've ever taken care of. Um, cool. Just set. Up, I mean, the way they're very low waste, low metabolism. They're tiny. Um, they don't eat for half the year, and they're bulletproof. You could probably shoot one and it would be okay. Um, I would oh, like relax. <laughs> but, so yeah, the Montane Rattlesnakes, at least, easiest reptile I've ever taken care of, without a doubt. Patrick. Yeah, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to agree with that. I always say that emeralds and chondros are the lowest maintenance. Not mm -hmm. easy, definitely not easy to breed, but lowest maintenance because they're stuck on that perch and removable perches make maintenance super low but as far as how hardy they are and the amount of maintenance required rock rattlesnakes are fucking dude i just i don't even like remember that i have them i'm like oh yeah i have these things i should probably do something with them oh did i feed them this month no doesn't fucking matter mm -hmm. literally feed, feed them a few times a year you, you just like they're just super, super easy and super hardy. They come from harsh climates with extreme temperatures in both directions. And, uh, and they're just really tough snakes. And they're like, like Steven said, they're small. They're just, uh, they're really easy. But uh, and I feel the same way about eyelash vipers. I've got about, I don't know, 15 eyelash vipers and uh, super hardy. Man, they, the eyelash vipers have been super easy. I've had pretty easy time getting babies going. Um, of all the stuff I've worked with, with very, very little exception and mostly just individuals, chondros are still the hardest babies to get going, in my opinion. Um, there are some arboreal vipers that are up there with them. But um, the cool thing is that learning how to tease feed baby chondros has taught me a lot about hel helping me get venomous established and vice versa that I've learned a lot of stuff, um, working with baby vipers that I incorporated into my chondro tease feeding game and, uh, and has gotten me a lot of success. And it's not just the experience. I've also gotten stuff, you know, Alex posts tease feeding videos and stuff sometimes. And I've incorporated some technique that I got from him. That's really helped me out. Um, so it goes, it goes both ways, um, with the, with establishing babies. Um, I, I still think chondros are the lowest maintenance snake and also one of the worst things to try to breed. Um, yeah. but like Steven said, there's a spectrum, a huge spectrum of venomous stuff. Um, as far as the ease of maintenance and ease of breeding and ease of establishing babies, it's, it's all over the place with those animals. Um, but like you, say, like you said, rock rattlers, super easy. And kind of touching to something that Patrick said earlier um, about having that protocol and having a room, part of why we stuck so heavily with all the Montane stuff is we have our one room where everything, when it's complete in a few weeks to a few months here, everything is venomous. Everything comes from a similar climate. And when you're in that room, you're working those animals a certain type of way, and it does not – stray from animal to animal i'm here in the in the scrub building i put my hands on every single snake in here every single week you know many of these snakes i like crawl around my neck and i always hold them in my hand when i'm cleaning their cage it's just a completely different world um 
And, you know, there's something about having that space dedicated that gets you into that mindset. Um, and then uh, ultimately is it just lends towards your safety and, and, you know, to the animals, um, especially with some of these montanes that need to get into the forties to reproduce, you know, you're not, you could take good care of them, but you're not going to have the most optimal success with those animals. If you're not dedicating a space, not just for your sake, but for their sake as well. So for a lot of reasons, that, that's a, a big part of my, you know, why do I do this is I want to be able to create a space that the animals will thrive in. And it also just uh, cultivates that environment where no matter what, the respect of the animals is always going to be something that's on your mind constantly. Yeah. Um, do you mind I, if I um, read? Oh, go ahead, Patrick. Go ahead. No, well, I was just going to say, I, 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 uh, I want to throw out there one of my protocol things I recently um, trying to not allow myself to work stuff um, when I'm tired. I, I made a couple of stupid yeah. mistakes, two, two in the same week, um, made stupid mistakes and uh, um, that fortunately didn't result in any, you know, nothing bad happened, but they were like both things that I did involving rattlesnakes could have been bad. And, uh, and it's because I, I'm just going all the time and so I have to really like prioritize when I work stuff. I've gotten to where I'll let myself be in the baby room at night um, because it's safer in there at night than it is in some of my other rooms. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I, I got to throw this out there too. Um, I've got Amber waiting on me, so I got to bail pretty quick. Um, I, Sunday is my only day off and I've been gone all day going to a reptile show and picking up cages and running errands. So I got to go spend some time with Miss Amber. Um, well, okay. Well, hold on, Patrick, Patrick, I love you, yeah. but you, you did not disclose this whatsoever. Um, which is I Amber, God bless her. She's going to get this, but I, I get a wrap up question though, for sure. hundred percent. Oh no, we're going to, we'll do, do, you know, if you want to do the hot seat, do the wrap up. And if you want, I'll tell that Gila monster story real fast. Okay, but I, I, my, my biggest thing is let me let me just end on this wrap up before we get into those two other things is okay. I, I want to get back to the reality of being a responsible keeper, you know, all around. But let's just keep it with the hots, right? Should somebody who keeps hots, especially somebody who has no anti venom or anything, like would the smartest thing to be or smartest thing to do is go tap into your veterinarian or or doctor or like or what like like especially if you don't know nobody, like what if you're you're this guy who has venomous fucking snakes. But no protocol if you get bit. Like, what is somebody like? What should somebody do in that case? So, a, a couple of things. Number one, get the bite protocols at least for the species. Joe Pittman will will sell you really cheap bite protocols for all. They're like fucking five dollars or something like that for for any species that you keep. You just message him, Florida Snake Bite Institute. He'll hook you up. Secondly, if you don't know anybody reach out and find people and have a community and have resources and people to talk to. I know people that have had their shit saved, saved their hands. I know a, a tattoo artist that got bit by a big Eastern diamondback rattlesnake and that's his hands are his fucking livelihood. And he saved his livelihood by not doing what the doctors told him to do and going on the advice of an experienced venomous keeper. And I'm not recommending that you go against medical advice. I'm just saying that him reaching out to a friend who was a venomous keeper saved his fucking hand and, and his, and therefore his livelihood. So, um, and he got rid of his venomous snakes after that. If you're on Facebook, I mentioned this multiple times already, venomous reptile keeper mentorship group. And it's not the only one, but it's, it, that's the one that I, I'm a. Um, I'm not hardly ever active in there because I don't have time um, for it lately. But uh, um, I am an, a, a moderator in that group, and there you can find people in there um, who can teach you things, people you can get with, and uh, you know it would be ideal to have anti venom on hand. But that's not just for your safety; it's so you're not depleting um, local zoo stock. Because if the hospital, at the hospital, they're going to have Crofab, that's it, or, or, or Anavip. And those are for North American pit vipers. 
any exotic that you get bit by, uh, you're going to deplete some zoo stock to save your life. And, um, and you're going to get like $150,000 hospital bill. Um, that's one of the reasons that we recommend keeping North American pit vipers like copperheads or rock rattlesnakes um, early, early on when you're learning to do this because the anti-venom is readily available. And be, while some of those animals are deadly, they're generally not deadly, especially with treatment. Um, so, and the other thing you may want to consider is if you have a propensity towards allergic reaction to toxins that you may want to have prescription EpiPens, epinephrine on hand as well. I know people that have had their lives saved by having epinephrine on hand so that they didn't go in an anaphylactic shock after a bite. Um, but you know, if, if you're keeping venomous stuff to answer the question again, more directly, if you're keeping venomous stuff and you don't have these things in place, fucking figure it out, get online, read shit, reach out to people, get a protocol in place. Um, I used to only work stuff if I had somebody there. I, that's not practical for me anymore. Um, but that's a good idea when you're a beginner, have somebody there with you, you know, um, the, just be safe, pull your ego out of it and ask questions and learn as much as you can from as many people as you can, people that you respect and people that have legit experience and people that are not waving cobras around on their fucking, uh, profile picture. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. God bless them all. Well, listen, Patrick, um, let's go ahead and end this with the Gila monster story. If you don't mind. Okay. I want to, uh, I've, I've asked you hot seat questions and it'd be awkward for Steven just to sit here and listen to him. So why don't we just, <laughs> why don't we just end this with the epic story that you've told many people at actual reptile shows, um, of okay. the story of you getting bit by the Gila monster. Sure. So, um, this was in 2001. Um, I know math is hard. That's over 20 years ago. <laughs> and uh, I was 20 years old. I was a heroin addict. I was no doubt high as fuck at the time. And uh, that was actually when I was first getting into being a, being a junkie. I was a baby junkie at that time. And uh, I had the Gila monster, this beautiful adult female Gila monster. And I, and my, my buddy Mike actually um, was keeping her at the time. And um, then he sold her, wanted to sell her back to the original keeper. And I said, let me get her because I, I knew I could place her. I didn't want this animal bouncing around. She was pink and amazing. And I knew that my buddy who owned the, the snake farm would buy her. And uh, this is not Eric Traeger. This is years before Eric bought the place when John had it. And I knew I could make a few bucks off of it too. So I took her down to the snake farm and she was a very sweet lizard, but I, um, the, the ride had her upset and on edge. Um, and when I got there, I didn't want her in the container anymore. I pulled her out and I was trying to calm her down. Um, and you know, if, if you have experience with Heloderma, and other lizards, they can be very responsive to touch. And you can, if you know how to work the animals, you can use touch to calm them down. And I've got a, a big ass beaded lizard here. It's Amber's. We've got a fucking huge Mexican beaded and he's still kind of, he's, he's young and kind of an asshole. Um, but uh, this girl was really sweet and I was calming her down. And I walked in holding her in a manner that I should not have been doing. I did not have her secured. I was kind of cradling her up against my body and I didn't realize how busy they were that day. And I walked in and it was a shit show in there. There was a line, uh, you know, for admission and I'm standing in line, like trying to figure out which direction I'm going to go. I'm like standing in front of the, the, the register and this little kid comes hauling ass through there and he's waving his arms and fucking screaming, ah! You know, and because there's like tons of badass animals in there and giant pythons and cobras and bats and all kinds of crazy shit, crocodiles. And now it's a legit zoo. If you've never been to Animal World Zoo on 35 in New Braunfels, Texas, fucking go. It's amazing. But 
Uh, it's been there forever. The And Eric has done amazing things with it. But this kid is basically running right at me. And I've got a fucking Gila monster in my arms like a dumbass. And and you're high. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm fucking high. And uh, uh, which was for uh, 16 years of my life, always the case at all times. Oh, my uh, God. And I've been clean for 10 years. Just going to throw that out there. Cheers, uh, hey, hey, by the way, I, hey, by the way, I'm six days on no dabs. Good for MJ. <laughs> all right. I'm serious. That's all right. Are you, are you over the headache and sleep I, again? I, I, uh, I don't want to get on it. I'll tell you guys on another story. But keep, 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 keep. Yeah. Congratulations. Um, so the I, – I felt her – getting like I knew this was going to happen but I had to step out of the way of the child that was sprinting towards me waving his arms in the air and so I pulled her tighter against me to like basically and and I stepped back from this kid and I felt her tense up and I knew I just fucking knew as soon as the way her body felt that she was going to get me and she just kind of clipped me with the side of her mouth. She, they do this kind of sideways strike thing. Yep. And she clipped me with the side of her mouth through my T-shirt. And I it instantly just ripped her off. I knew her teeth were in there, but I just snatched her off of me because that is not an animal that you want clamped down. Their venom glands are in the lower jaw. It's not like a tied to the tooth like a vipers or a lapids are where it's a hypodermic type of thing going on. Venom glands are in the lower jaw, and when they bite down, the venom comes up through the gums and goes in through the t- where the teeth are, are piercing the flesh. And their venom, unlike snakes that are designed for predation, their venom is designed to cause pain. It's designed for – it has specifically designed to cause pain for defense. And it is – their jaws are like a vice grip. I was very fortunate to her just get a, a little bit of my skin in her mouth. Um, everybody that I know that's been bitten said on the hand said it was like slamming their hand in a fucking car door with teeth and venom. And, um, I snatched her off of me and I lifted up my shirt and my dumb ass, I'm concerned about my khaki Abercrombie shorts getting blood on them. Like that was my, that was my fucking priority. No joke. I was like, oh fuck, I don't want to fucking bleed on my khaki Abercrombies. They were like 50 bucks, which is yeah, a lot of back, money. Back, back then, that was like Gucci shit back in the early 2000s. Yeah. Abercrombie was like, that's like, you're, you're rich if you got that shit. Yeah, yeah, man. Well, and when you're a 20-year-old junkie in 2001, 50 bucks was, you know, a chunk of change. I, and I wasn't going to spend it on another pair of khaki shorts. That's for goddamn sure. Uh, so the – I. Their blood is somewhat anticoagulant, and plus she just tore me wide open. And I literally caught the blood just in time from fucking off my shorts. And the the thing is, though, I'm getting this out of order a little bit. Before I stopped the blood, the guy behind the counter, this was the slickest shit. The guy behind the counter, he's the only other person that saw this occur. Nobody else standing around even ever saw the lizard because I, I thought I was being kind of you know, kind of concealing it myself once I realized how many people were in there. And I'll reiterate that I'm a dumbass and all of this was fucking stupid. And this dude, his eyes got wide. He knew I got bit. His, I see his eyes get wide. This motherfucker in front of all these people reaches over, grabs the Gila monster from me, pulls out a drawer from underneath the register and slaps that bitch in there and slides it shut in like a fraction of a second, dude. Nobody saw this happen. I'm so su- we're surrounded with people. I get bit. He grabs a fucking lizard, throws her under the register and fucking nobody sees it. And so that's when I lifted up my shirt and caught the blood and saved my shorts. And I went running to the bathroom and the blood was filling up my hand and dripping off onto the floor, pouring it like, like had filled up my palm and dripping onto the floor. And I get back to the bathroom and these guys are on this shit. They have lots of dangerous animals here. John's son, who was like 10 years old at the time, he's right behind me with a fucking first aid kit. Like literally followed me into the room with it. He wasn't even standing there when it happened. And the motherfucker follows me into the bathroom with a first aid kit. 
I was like, God damn, I got bit in the right fucking place, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And uh, they have a basin sink back there. And when the water hits that blood, dude, it was a mess, man. The whole sink was full of blood. And I'm dumping fucking alcohol and peroxide and dial fucking soap on it. And I have these big, nasty gashes because I just snatched her off. Her teeth were in me. I just snatched her off of me. Show us the scar. Show us the scar. Let's see the scar. I, I bet we can see it. Let's see it. He wants to show his body off. Uh, see that? Right there? Can we yeah. see that? Right there? Yeah, I can see it. Damn. That's nice so that's where her teeth, like, clamped in. And then the – oh, yeah, I can see it on the screen there, yeah. That's and that's – I mean, that scar is still there from fucking – from 20 years ago, 21 years ago. That was September of 2001. And uh, so um, – yeah, I got it all cleaned up. It was super painful. I bandaged it up and like literally like wrapped tape around my torso to like keep the gauze on it. And I uh, had to change that a couple times because it kept bleeding. And the bite was actually not very painful. But when the venom started to kick in, dude, it was rough, man. It felt like... Um, Every time my heart beat, it felt like somebody was hitting me in the rib hammer. It was throbbing. Like, did, did you puke? No. Um, did not make me nauseous, but I started sweating and kind of cold sweating. And um, my face turned red. And then my, like, this kind of reddish purple started kind of spreading out from my side and kind of ran across my chest and up my neck. Um, yeah. And like a really, really bad sunburn is kind of what it looked like. Um, and it was, it was not, there wasn't really much of any, any other symptoms other than that pain, the throbbing when my heart was beating, the, the redness was it. And like, say I got clammy and kind of sweaty and people kept asking me, are you all right? And I'm like, yeah, yeah fuck, I'm all right. I was not all right. I played yeah. it off like it's all right. Um, and it later, I don't know if this is because I was a smoker and because my health was not in great shape or whatever, but it went necrotic. And, may, and maybe it was just the venom caused enough tissue damage, but it turned black and I could smell it and the skin was like sloughing off. Like it was fucking nasty oh bite. Oh my dude. God, bro. Yeah. And uh, um, I remember, but, you know, I, I sold the animal and uh, – and she had a nice, good home down there, and I made about 450 bucks off of it. And uh, when I got back, I lifted up my shirt, and my buddy Mike was like, no fucking way. And then the, when I went to go give the break off the cash to the dude who, who was originally, you know, who was selling her, he didn't believe me that I got bit. He was like, nah, bro, you, you got hung up in a barbed wire fence or something. And I was like, no, no dude. The fucking lizard bit me and uh but yeah it was nasty and john at the snake farm next time i saw him he was like you ever go to the hospital for that and i was like no what the fuck is the hospital gonna do there's not like anti-venom what are they gonna give me some fucking vicodin i had heroin in my pocket what do i need vicodin for <laughs> fuck dude what a fucking crazy story bro yeah Insane. man well listen patrick two hours went by pretty quick you gave us yeah. enough um, I'm definitely not enough. I'm, I'm going to need you back here. Um, I have something in store for venomous uh, type segments, and I want you involved with it. And I'm not going to give any details right now, but I will talk to you off camera about this segment. Um, but either way, I got to say, Patrick, we had over 60 people tapped in for this episode. Um, what, do you have to say to, what do you have to say to everyone who was tuned in, um, really inspired and intrigued about everything you had to say about your venomous talk? Um, first of all, thank you. It still boggles my mind that people want to sit around and listen to me fucking run my mouth about snakes. Um, so thank you for taking the time. Um, also, once again, shout out and apologies to Amber for eating up our whole Sunday with snake stuff, but she understands. And uh, thank you, Amber. Guys, if you're listening to this because you're interested in keeping venomous reptiles, go back and listen to it again and pick out the things that I said and see what resonates with you and just be safe and don't be stupid. When you try to choose what you want to work with, 
make sure it's something you love. And then beyond that, you know, just take a look at what you think is going to be the safest thing to start with. There's an, a subject we didn't touch on that we don't really have time for, um, but I will mention it briefly. Some people say you can't learn uh, using non-venomous stuff, that it doesn't prepare you. That is fucking bullshit. Don't ever listen to anybody who says that. Anybody who says that is either dumb, doesn't understand, or is repeating something that somebody else said. Saying that working non-venomous does not prepare you for working venomous is like saying that sparring doesn't prepare you for fighting. It True. most fucking certainly does. You can learn how certain animals move. You can learn how to use your equipment better. So, you know, work with, if you don't have experience with non-venomous stuff, probably should be doing that before you step into venomous stuff. And when you do, just be safe, man. These animals are amazing. They deserve our respect. And, uh, and we're all trying to keep doing this. So don't be the dumbass that fucks it up for everybody. Uh, yeah. You know why? Because you know why? There, there is going to be a dumbass that fucks it up for all of us. It's already going to happen. But thing is, like, always one guy. guy. Don't be that, that guy. Man. And so, like, don't it's like, guy. don't be something that's already happening. Be different. You know what I mean? Like, and just, I don't know, man. There's, uh, Patrick, you're the man, bro. Patrick, you are the man. I got to say, first and foremost, thank you for being my friend. Thank you for being Steven's friend. But being the hobbies yeah. friend, like, dude, you're really here to give people time a day. Like, you give. Yeah. A lot of people, your time and day when you have a fucking full day ahead of you. So, like I said, enough is enough. Go enjoy the rest of your night with Amber. Amber, thank you so much for giving me this piece of meat. This guy's amazing. But that's a wrap <laughs> for Patrick Holmes, ladies and gentlemen. Love you guys. I'll talk to y'all later. All right. See you later, bro. Yeah. Steven, you're going nowhere, motherfucker. You're right here. <laughs> hey, um, listen, Steven. Um, I know yes. you happen to come in late, um, but period. I mean, I'm glad that you tapped in. Overall, um, what do you think of the Texas venomous community? And what I mean by that, I was asking Patrick earlier in the episode about how come I feel like some of the best venomous keepers are all in Texas. And I could be wrong, but I mean, like for a community base, like, I mean, do you yeah. feel like Texas has it going on better than anywhere else when it comes to venomous? Oh, uh, I mean, they're definitely up there. Um, I think. You know, for, for me, a few people that I look up to um, primarily happen to be in Texas, um, you know, like and not to to go over a topic you already discussed, but like with with Kyle, he's in El Paso and he's, a, you know, a drive away from the habitat of all the stuff that he keeps um, or a lot of the stuff that he keeps, which is pretty inspirational. And, you know, I've been lucky enough to be out there a couple of times find clobber eye and black tails and stuff in the wild with him and uh, sleep in their habitat. And, you know, it gave me a much better understanding. Um, Texas really just is one of the stronger, if not potentially the strongest state for a community in, in reptiles. Um, like Patrick was saying earlier in the show, historically it's always been Florida, but also, you know, historically, the hobby's problems have stemmed from Florida, grew in Florida, and then expanded outwards. Um, you know, you don't see ish, uh, errors that um, that keepers in, in Texas make uh, ruining stuff for everyone else in the country like you have seen with Florida. So that's why I, I kind of give the nod to Texas over Florida as far as the best state for reptiles go. Um, you know, one of the reasons. So, uh, but yeah, I respect, respect a good amount of the, the venomous guys out there in Texas and, uh, very, very good community. Now for somebody who is just getting his feet wet and I could, I could <clears throat> confidently say that you're just now gaining a lot of knowledge off the venomous throughout the last year or so, but only based off because you've been retaining it and stuff. Right. So a lot of the stuff that you've been like, I mean, I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong, Stephen, but how long have you been wanting to work with Venomous for? Like, I Oh, I mean, Venomous like, reptiles venomous. have been a part of my life since I was 13 years old. And so you've always loved them. You've always – like, so at some point as a kid, just like how you love ball pythons at one point. Yeah. <laughs> but like you – that so Venomous hit something to you at a young age. 
Oh, I, I mean, I, I can't remember when that switch flipped in my head, but if I was 10 years old, you know, that would be late. Like I, I've always wanted to, to do venomous. Um, I, you know, I got super lucky when, when I was 13, I started volunteering at the wildlife discovery center outside of Chicago. And, uh, you know, the first day I, I was ever there, I walk into a room, look to my right, nine foot Bushmaster, five foot Gaboon Viper, six foot Eastern Diamondback, three King Cobras, West African Green Mamba, Neotropical Rattlesnakes. Like I was in heaven. I'm like, wow, the, like I, or, you know, Ceraceus Viper, Sidewinders, like I was, I was just shocked. Um, you know, I never was able to work any of the venomous there, but being there, seeing other people do it, kind of picking up on on little things, um, you know, the exposure prepared me well. And um, when, you know, I didn't want to interrupt Patrick when he was talking, but the number one thing that prepared me for keeping venomous was working with non-venomous. I just yeah. made a very conscious decision from a young age. I was probably 14. I'm like, I'm going to, not completely, but I'm going to just teach myself habits to where when I start working venomous, it'll be seamless. Like for the longest time, you know, with the exception of like baby ball pythons, I'm opening hooks with rack or racks with hooks. Not right. because whatever's in there is dangerous, because if that was a venomous snake, you'd have to do that to where I'm going to open the tub. I reach for a hook just as, you know, second nature. And then, um, just becoming super familiar with the with handling and with the equipment like you know I'll, I'll tell people that i feel more comfortable with a snake hook than behind the wheel of a car um that doesn't really speak to my driving abilities i feel like but more just to you know this is how comfortable i feel with a snake hook because i was handling snakes with hooks since well before i ever really needed to for from like a safety standpoint um you know, opening enclosures with, with hooks and stuff like that, kind of like what Patrick was saying, um, putting animals into holding containers, uh, just doing things to, to teach yourself the fundamentals when the danger is not present. And then, although it's not always possible, finding a mentor, um, finding someone in your area that keeps venomous. And, and there's a double-edged sword there because you can find someone who keeps venomous and does a shit job. That's and and you know. Okay, ben, okay Steven, 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna stop you right now because one one thing that is so player about what it is that you do is I feel like whatever it is that you're investing in, you find the right people to get mentored with, or you find the right people doing it the best that are doing it. And yeah. when you you when you and Andrew introduced me to Kyle Vargas, and I I, I probably reach around about this all the time about this guy. But that motherfucker, like, holy shit. Like, dude. And that's nuts because, like, you know, you guys, you and Andrew, shout to AA, fucking, <laughs> what a guy. Um, you guys are, you guys, just like Patrick and everyone else doing it right with the Venomous, you guys are low-key about the Venomous shit. Right now you're good, but, you know, you're not out there advertising it at all. No, not really. I mean, that's kind of to me, part of the whole, you know, philosophy behind it earlier, um, just for, for, for the sake of what we're, we're doing, I'm not going to name names, but we had somebody, uh, some people here at our collection recently showing them around, uh, you know, two people who I respect more than many, many people in this industry. And, um, and, you know, we were just eating some food after taking a look at all the animals. And, and she just says to me very honestly, it's like, she said, this is going through all your venomous, was probably the most comfortable I've ever been in a collection of venomous snakes. Wow. Just from the the attitude that you know we we use towards the animals, the level of respect, our enclosures, just like there was no nervous energy of we're doing something that could kill us. And you know, because you, you'll see people handle handle their venomous and look in their rooms, and you'll be like, oh man, this is. You know, I, I trust that they know their animals and they're not free handling, but I'm kind of sketched out. I've been in the same the same shoes too, being uh you know places with venomous. So to hear that compliment from somebody who's been in this industry longer than I have and has been around, you know, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people and collections. Um, 
well that, this also goes this also goes back to you getting mentored by the right people and i mentioned before you yeah. came on I, I mentioned before you came on and this is i'm glad i could talk about you to about this because you've been at this collection and i don't need to be at the collection physically to know that this is one of the nice privately kept venomous rooms ever and that's cody's room cody's yeah. fucking oh my god like just a yeah, video I mean, oh my god bro i you know one thing that i recommend to people but i didn't really have uh would be you know find somebody who does the venomous and just be there all the time slowly but surely kind of gain that experience i i didn't really have a have anywhere like that to go and, and handle someone else's venom routinely like over the course of a year or two before getting my own but yeah. if there's one person that i would definitely credit for imparting that knowledge on me it would definitely be cody um you know i've been lucky enough to have a, had a few pretty full days just seeing him work the animals working a few myself and just you know him, him walking me through every step of it um yeah it says a lot about somebody when they can't you know when when they're not only um, you know, taking care of their animals, they have great setups, they're breeding, but especially with the venomous, when they can explain to somebody else everything about how they're doing it. Right. That that to me kind of really shows mastery in your craft. When you're not only able to do it, but you're able to teach somebody else up to your level um, effortlessly. And that and you know, Cody's really a teacher at heart. Um, not to speak for him, but but that's really, you know, one of the things he's most passionate about within reptiles is, you know, imparting that knowledge and partially because he knows and it's just the truth that there are so few people out there that really have good information to give. And, uh, and, 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 you know, what's, you know, I don't mean to cut you off, Stephen, and uh, I'm just saying, and, and one of those people is like our guest tonight. Like you want to talk about yeah. somebody with information that give like, like, you know, I was saying how much time this guy gives to people, anybody. You don't need Great. to be somebody like no. this motherfucker. If you, if you, if you, if he feels like you are wanting to learn and you want, like you have passion behind your question, this guy will give you more than an answer. I'll tell you that much. Yeah. And, uh, I, I you know, I can't commend, uh, Patrick enough for that. You know, I, I, I like to think that I'm, I'm okay at that, but I, I know that. I, I can't nearly touch Patrick as far as the, uh, you know, attention to new people and questions and just being somebody with with information to and, and who's willing to give it. A lot of people have information, but there are, are definitely the type of people out there that are kind of guarding that information or, and, and, you know, either truly too busy to give it out or make themselves think they're too busy to give it out. Um, Patrick is definitely not one of those people. He will give like you said, anyone the time of day. And it's, it's super commendable uh, because there are very few people in this hobby who are like that, especially with the quality of information and the quantity that Patrick has. Some people will give out information and it's total dog shit. If you're hearing something from Patrick, it's legit. I mean, I also don't want to take this away from you, my man, Stephen Cush, AKA the Scrub King. Very informative, bro. I'm telling you right now, Unfiltered Reptile Podcast is back, but that means we need to come back. We need yes, Stephen Cush. We need Desiree. We need to come back. But Stephen, for anyone out there who's wondering how they could stay on top of things, whether it's your productions or, you don't know, maybe you coming back on a podcast, what's the best way people could follow you? I mean, primarily Instagram and Facebook, uh, Scrub Shepherd on Instagram, and then just my name on Facebook. Uh, you know, you can also follow Desiree on her social medias, Cold Blooded Cafe and Rep Tech, um, to kind of keep up with everything that's going on around here. And, uh, you know, we, we do, we do the best we can with, with posting and keeping everyone up to date, but, uh, whenever there's something important, we definitely get it out there. And, uh, I know it's a little early on, but since I'm here, might as well do it. Um, we're, as far as the cold blooded cafe side goes, we're coming up to our biggest week of the year. Uh, and I'm talking about black Friday. So let's go, let's yeah. go, uh, everyone. I feel like kind of waits for this, but this is our biggest sale of the year. Um, every year, our biggest deals on the, the largest uh, selection from our catalog. Um, and then this year with Black Friday, what will be a little different than years past is that we do have day old chicks and uh, African soft fur rats on the website available. 
And uh, who knows, those items might be on sale for Black Friday as well if you want to try them out. Oh, my God. The freshest and best. It's Rodent Company in the game. Hey, listen, I am so proud. I, don't, I, I love my sponsorships, all 10 of them. But Cold Blooded Cafe, I hold dearly to my heart, man. We thank you OG. so much. I, dude, thank but you. You guys are the OG to me, period. I mean, listen, you guys believed in me before any other sponsor. But I want to say, Steven, keep doing Steven. Keep doing Des. Keep doing Rep Tech. Keep doing what you guys are doing because big things are happening. And uh, Steven, big things to come with this podcast with me and you. I know it's a matter of time. But that's a wrap for Stephen Cush. Ladies and gentlemen, have a good night, Stephen. Thank you very much. All right, bro. Love you, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'll talk to you soon. Yeah. All right, guys. Listen, Trap Talk Patreon after party going on right now. We're already 10 minutes late, guys. I already got trappers tapped in. If you want to have a rebrief section, if you want to decompress about this episode, kind of touch base on what you guys thought, or just say hi to our damn trappers. Tap in right now. The after party is about to go down. Let's go. Click on the very first link in the description below. And the link to the Trap Talk Zoom call after party is in the community post. Guys, what a great episode. I got to say thank you so much. Make sure you go follow me on Instagram, the Trap Talk God. Excuse me, the Trap God 619 on Instagram. And go follow the podcast's page on Instagram as well, the Trap Talk Podcast. Um, and again, don't forget if you're on Facebook, like because you have to be like me, because I'm friends with Ed Marino. Go to the Trap Talk Podcast page on Facebook and go like that shit. Go follow it, please. I really appreciate it. And uh, guys, we have things. Uh, we have a big week coming up. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna tell you what's happening Thursday, but I will tell you what's happening tomorrow. New breeder on the block series. I got my boy Marcus Wolf from Morph. Morphologics. Hope I said that right. Morphologics. Morphologics. New breed on the block series going down. This guy has came highly recommended by my own Patreon members. Um, so yeah, let's go. Tell me more, man. If you inspire people in this shit, I want to. I want to know more because you know if it's one thing that this hobby needs more, is people, aka breeders, to inspire. So let's do this shit, guys. Thank you so much. If you happen to tap in late to this episode, it's never too late. To hit that like button. So make sure you hit that like button. Drop a comment. Let me know what you like best. And again, my Trap Talk Patreon family. I'll see you guys right now for the after party. Everyone have a good night. I'm out. Cheers.